Uh, so my name is Chris Sheehy. I work directly for Omron. Uh, I represent the safety services business. Absolutely love what I do. I love representing machine safety, uh, keeping things safe, and yet also making sure that they stay productive as an equally important piece, right? Uh, Omron, our, our uh, core motto is to improve lives and contribute to a better society. And I really truly feel that uh, in order to improve lives, you have to preserve them first and make sure that they're all, uh, they go home safe at the end of the night. Everybody goes home safe at the end of the night. Um, and I feel very privileged to be hopefully either directly or indirectly as a result of some of the things that I do on a day-to-day -day basis can help contribute to that, God willing. Um, so we're going to, today we are all here to uh, cover machine safeguarding. So we're going to talk about a very specific process that we go through to ensure that we are properly addressing machine safety. And this is a big room. I've never actually had an audience this big, so this is new for me. Um, usually what I do is I go around the room and I ask everybody uh, why you're here and what you would like to get out of the meeting. For this, with the sake of time, what I'd like to do, if it's okay, can we have like maybe one representative from each company? Because I know there's multiple folks from each company. Just a quick bit about your company, what you guys do, and maybe something that you're hoping to get out of this class. Um, if we could do that, that would be amazing. Really good. So I, a couple of things I heard there is just is making sure things are safe. Standards play a big part in this, right? And it's safety is, we want to make it, as much as we try and make it defined and mathematical, at the end of the day, it's, it's uh, a lot about uh, there's a lot of gray areas, right? And hopefully we can remove some of that um, confusion or ambiguity. And I hope to do that for you today. So let's kick this, get this party started here. It's small. <laughs> okay, so purpose of the machine safety skill builder life. Um, we did a little bit of intros. Uh, we talked about why we're here. We're here to talk about machine safety. Hopefully get some tools that we can use to bring back to our facilities to uh, better guard our machines and keep them productive. Um, I'd like to share this formal process. It's not something that I made up. It's something that I'm sharing with you that comes directly out of the national standards uh, that helps us uh, formally identify and rectify machine safety discrepancies. So anything that's not safe primarily, and also importantly, anything that's not compliant with the standards. Okay, does everybody have a uh, gotcha stick? You see, you guys hold those or got this. Everybody got one of those, All right? Cool, got that. Um, you also should have a USB. Put the USB in front of them. If you don't, just let let myself or Matt know, and we'll make sure you get taken care of. Within the USB, you're going to get a PDF of this presentation. So if you have any questions, you can go back and look at that. I also have a safe distance mounting document, which will uh, provide safe distance guidance for you for mounting things like light curtains, safety scanners, uh, cards, so there'll be some safe distance calculation information. This ISO design guide is extremely helpful. This is for the safety engineers in the room where we're doing uh, performance level uh, requirements, PLRs, what's the performance level required, and what's the performance level that we've achieved. So doing like verification on safety circuits, that ISO design guide goes through actually provides an example of how to determine your performance level. And when you design components, how do you verify that the components in the circuit actually uh, meet the performance level required out of the risk assessment identification? And that's a really helpful tool. Do I have any safety engineers in the room? Okay, you guys will find that helpful. Um, and then for the rest of you, there's great general information on standards how to do risk analysis. Um, and then we also have an assessment template, okay? And this is a form that you can use. Um, it will go through what we cover today, but it, it covers all of the seven categories of compliance uh, for safety for machinery. So there's point of operation, mechanical power transmission, safety rated controls, safeguarding devices, lockout, tagout. It lays that all out for you and it provides a template that you can do your own assessment on. And it gives you a roadmap to do that and to document that. And we'll talk, the first half of this class is going to be all about how do we conduct the formal risk assessment and what do we doc, what do we do and what do we document in a formal risk assessment? So there's your assessment 
uh, template that you'll have. Um, so you guys all have that on your USB stick. All right, so here's a general agenda of what we will cover. Um, it does not, safety doesn't have to be nebulous or complicated. Um, it's it's practical information and most importantly it requires intention and that's the big thing you guys are already here you're spending four or five hours out of your day uh to come and hang out with us you're you're doing the right things because it's intentionally on your mind and that's a big part of safety there's also some details that we'll cover um, but i would say the intentionality is a huge part of it once we have that um we with the rest with the tools that you have uh, will give you a great base to or continue on your your journey of safeguarding um, so we're going to go over the relevant regulations so this is the standard stuff that gets confusing domestic and international standards right and there's always there's always fierce debates over application of safeguards and what the standards say right uh, but we're going to go over those and what they are and which ones to reference we're going to talk about a practical approach to risk assessment and risk reduction, which is our first step in any safeguarding application to perform a risk assessment. Then we're going to talk about once we've established a base level of risk, we're going to talk about how do we mitigate against that risk? And that's the hierarchy of control. Um, and we'll talk about that. That applies to how do we actually reduce the risk that we've identified in the initial uh, risk assessment? That's going to be the first half of today that we'll break for lunch. Uh, we'll come back. We'll talk about guarding technologies and when to specify them. With that piece, we will also talk about how do we meet the performance level requirements with the guarding technology that we've identified in our risk assessment. And that's a huge piece. The, the, the main thing that we get out of risk assessment is documenting the hazards and understanding what is the required safety provided, right? If it's a super hazardous thing that's going to that's, that could potentially cut my arm off. Sure, there's going to be circuit redundancy. There's going to be more complicated equipment we need to apply to make sure that there's never a failure, right? If it's a, if the hazard is a bump or a bruise, we may be able to get away with a simple single channel system. Doesn't necessarily need to be redundant uh, because the amount of risk there is not very high. And so those are things that come into how we identify safety so that we're not over applying engineering but with it, importantly, we're not under applying it, okay? So we'll talk about that. And there's some electrical design stuff in there. Um, you guys will appreciate, uh, but there's also just to get, get your mind around what a circuit looks like when there's super high risk versus a lower risk safety circuit. So that'll, that'll help kind of piece together the technology and the architecture of the circuit. Um, that's this piece here. Um, then we're going to talk about the types of safety rated controls and monitoring devices. Okay, and then that'll close out the day. I would encourage you guys, please ask questions. Um, would love for this to be interactive. I've done the presentation a bunch. And so if you have questions, um, I appreciate those because I'm always learning as I go down this, this road as well. Okay, so that's our agenda. So let's talk about quickly who Omron is. So Omron is a global company. Uh, we're Founded in uh, Japan, we do over $8 billion in global sales. We have a bunch of different divisions, of which industrial automation and business for factory automation is about, I believe, 40% of the revenue. Eric, you can probably, yeah, close enough. Um, we also do automotive electronics, social systems, healthcare. You guys have ever seen an Omron blood pressure monitor? I had strep throat a couple months ago, not very much fun, but the lady did my own blood pressure, I had a little Omron things like right on there uh, so we do have some healthcare stuff and then if any of you guys do automotive or work on cars sometimes you'll see omron control relays in automotive uh, so we've got a lot of different divisions uh, the division i work for is industrial automation uh, as i mentioned before our goal in life is to improve lives contribute to a better society and uh and we do that we do that on a daily basis So what do I, what am I trying to sell you guys today? <laughs> Besides convincing you to take accountability for your safety, right? What can I offer you? Um, so what Machine Safety Services offers, um, we do this class as a formal day and a half class. This is kind of a condensed, let's get you exposed to what we're, you know, get you exposed to safety. 
Uh, but we do a, a day and a half class where we'll go through all of this in a day. The second half or the first half of the second day, we will actually go on your plant floor and we'll do a risk assessment with you on a piece of equipment. So um, we also do with that, it's it's not outlined there, but we do TUV functional safety engineering training. So I've Omron sponsored me through that class and I was able to get TUV functional safety engineering certified, which means that I'm certified to do risk assessments, circuit designs, verification, validation. Super cool. Omron offers that class. We also offer a TUV technician class, which is more for not the guy that assesses and designs and verifies and validates, but it's more for the guy that's living with the equipment on the shop floor and starts having red lights and the machine's not working. Uh, we can train that guy on how to care for that machine, how to do upgrades, uh, replacements, things of that nature. Uh, so we do a lot of training. That's that's number one. Number two, uh, we do offer formal risk assessment um services and i can show you uh, over the lunch break i can give you an example of what those deliverables look like uh, that we do um, we provide engineering review and solution design this is after we've identified the risks we can design the safety and we can install it when we install it we train your operators train your maintenance people on how to use it care for it um, and then finally and lastly and probably most importantly in the world of safety we validate safety solutions. So we can actually go in, whether it's work that's been done or it's work that we're doing, we can go in and validate and say, yes, this solution does in fact meet the performance levels that we needed to achieve um, and it's applied properly. And here's the document that says, so, right? So we can do that for you, okay? So in a nutshell, we can make it easier for you guys to sleep at night with respect to safety. <laughs> that's, the, that's a high level summary. Okay, oh, there's the validation piece. You guys probably see it before watching David Letterman. Hey, you guys watch David Letterman? Yeah, remember, remember the Will It Float game? You did? Yeah, yeah. The Will It Float game, it was the strangest game ever. It's like, Will, there's this huge tank and they would throw stuff. Anyways, he also had a top 10. You guys remember the top 10? Okay. So OSHA has a top 10 list also, okay? And they put together every year, they have a top 10 of most cited safety hazards, okay? What I'm showing here, we look at 2020, okay? Number 10 is machine safety, machine guarding, uh, machine and mach <laughs> machine machinery and machine guarding, okay? Number six is control of hazardous energy or lockout tag out. Okay, and then you can see we can go back through the years. 2019, number nine, machine guarding. Okay, it's always machine guarding and lockout tag outs, always there. Fall protection is always near the top. Okay, lockout tag out number four, machine guarding, the topic of today. We touch on lockout tag out when we do assessments, by the way, and we'll talk about it just briefly today. Top 10, 2018, no surprise. Number nine, machine safeguarding. Number five, lockout tag out. Fall protection is number one. 2017, okay, machine guarding number eight, lockout tag out number five, okay, and the list goes on. It's always top 10. So we're trying to get, we're trying to move that out of here, we're trying to take care of that, okay. You can see fall protection is always, always up near the top. Okay, so it's an important topic. It's an important topic, machine guarding. Okay, then OSHA, they do these things where they'll they'll cite companies, right, that are in violation of their of the standards that they refer to. Okay, and below are the maximum penalty amounts with annual adjustments for inflation that may be assessed after January 15th. So there's a serious, other than serious, failure to abate, willful or repeated. Okay. So the way this works is if you have a piece of equipment on the floor, let's say it's a medical device manufacturing piece of equipment. And OSHA cites uh, a serious violation on there, and you've got 10 of those same machines. Is it $13,653 for all 10? No, it's 10 times that. Okay, so it's $136.53. Okay, so as you can see, these add up quick. Failure to abate $13,653 per day beyond the abatement date. That's basically, hey, we cited you. 
you guys haven't fixed this yet. Now we're going to cite you that amount per day beyond the abatement date times 10 for each day if you have 10 of those pieces of equipment on the floor. Okay. The last one is like, we cited you, you just don't care, you're not doing anything. Okay. $136,000. You're, you're, you're uh, willfully violating. You have no intention of fixing things. Okay. So the point here is some pretty hefty penalties, right? And that's, that would just be, let's say, for one serious on a piece of equipment where you've got 10 of those pieces of equipment. That's just one machine in the plant, right? Think how many machines we, we have in our factories. Those can add up quickly. So, so that's a justification for why we should be here and put some intention on this. Okay, this is uh, July 19th, 2021. Federal inspection finds El Paso metal stamping manufacturer willfully exposed workers to amputation dangers. Worker suffers severe injury. D&D manufacturing fined $412,000 for that. Okay. That was two willful, 12 serious, three other than serious. $412,000, okay? And somebody lost two fingers. So I think we can get a lot of bargain done for $412,000? Absolutely, easily. Okay, so penalties, fines. Um, black investments, uh, decision to remove guards led to an incident. Okay, just the third week working for a Trent manufacturer, 21 year old machine operator's life changed forever. Operators suffered a partial hand amputation because the company allowed protective guards to be removed from a machine that cuts sheet metal for the roofing industry. And work fast when the guards are gone. Okay. Um, and there was an incident, somebody lost part of their hand. This is July 27th, 2021. Agency proposed $122,000 in penalties, just in penalties. Okay. Oh, significant. Here's another one. Uh, this is it's the milk plant. Yep, this is the milk plant. 339K in proposed penalties. Uh, this was an amputation. Okay. Hopefully the fingers didn't land in the milk cart. Papers on that. Okay. Um, every month, OSHA finds $900,000 per month just in penalties, okay? And then you guys know what happens is if an incident happens on a machine, is it, hey, Bob's hurt, throw throw Matt on there, get Matt on the machine. Bob's not able to operate, it's not, that's not what it is, right? It's lock the machine down, no more production, okay? So the production costs, production loss. But on top of that, $900,000 per year is what OSHA typically is citing in penalties. And then this number, is fairly staggering. This is 18. Any ideas on 18? 18 per month? 18 deaths per month as a result of the safeguarding, of the improperly taking care of safeguarding. So we want to change it. We want to make that look. Okay. Well, so we went to this machine safeguarding class. We learned a bunch of cool stuff, learned how to do a risk assessment. We learned how to identify hazards. We learned which hazards we should approach first, and we're pretty we're pretty close. We're almost there. We got 99.9% .9 compliant. We're good. Okay, this is just a slide to illustrate in safety what 99.9% .9 represents in a real world situation. And this is why when people ask us, you know, um, why does it take so long? How how come the diligent efforts? Right. So we're not cutting corners. We need things to be 100%. Real life scenario, 99.9%. .9%. What does it mean? One hour of unsafe drinking water per month. Two unsafe landings at O'Hare International per day. Okay. 15 newborn babies dropped at birth by doctors each day. Yeah, no good. 22, so these last two, these last two hurt. 22,000 checks deducted from the wrong account each day, and your heart fails to beat 32,000 times each year. OK. So just one incident is all it takes, and that's why we want to stress 100 percent compliance. Because if we're not at 100 percent. We we might have uh, situations, OK. So this is why we're here. We're learning about how to assess and how to figure out which one's the most important to address. 
Okay. Failure to assess hazards and reduce risk can result in serious injury. Okay. Fall protection. Number one on the list. These guys were hired as, as certified electricians in their trade. Craigslist even, even said it on the Craigslist ad. Okay. They'll come out, we'll fix your AC, certified HVAC electricians. They do have safety in mind. There's we have a primary safeguard here. Okay. <laughs> We've got redundancy built into the system. Okay. AC, AC fails. Ball protection, right? I don't know what that guy's up to. Okay. Yes, boss, I've taken the forklift operator training certification. I'm fully certified to operate forklifts, operate them safely all the time. These guys are certified. They took the test. There wasn't a common sense forklift. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, and, and I see what he's kind of, you know, he's doing this thing. So he's driving this one. This guy's operating this one, right? I'm not sure he's what this he's up to. Okay. There we go. Some Emmys in the room. Counterbalance, right? These guys are trained. They took the test. They're certified. Okay. We make bad decisions every once in a while. I'd argue that was a bad one. Understanding and operating within the limits of the equipment. That's a big part. Knowing what equipment we're working with, knowing the scope of what we're working with, knowing how it's supposed to function. Okay. Good way to get ocean lake or waterfront property mm -hmm. right here. It's on grass, yeah. He's not wearing shoes. Okay. <laughs> follow safe work procedures and practices. Okay. What what can be done here to remove some of this risk? Besides remove the alcohol from the equation. Okay. So that's probably what led him for, to have the courage to do this whole this whole setup. You know. Beautiful. Yeah, I like that cordless drill. Metallic ladder. Non-metallic ladder. Both really good answers. A lot of times they get drained in the pool. Good answer, a lot of effort, right? So, uh, that reminds me of working with my dad in the garage. So I something like that. My dad was a painter. He painted cars, like growing all growing up, right? We paint cars. I remember one time I was in the living room and he walked in to get a cup of coffee after he's done painting the car. He goes, oh, shoot. He runs back out in the garage. Okay, I don't really think much. Dad opens back in. I go, Dad, what's up? Oh, I left the pilot light on. <laughs> like, like, the hot water heater. Like, oh yeah, no big deal. Misting explosive chemicals everywhere. Anyways, what well, pops. All right, so here's a practical example. Common sense, real world, right? This is what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Press has a light curve, okay? Uh, appears to be compliant. Nobody's ever been injured on this thing. See this all the time in plants. It's got light curtain. It's, it's compliant. Nobody's ever been hurt. We're good. Good to go. Upon closer inspection, this is what we find, right? Light curtains are type 2, not type 4. So most of the time now, type 4 light curtains are pretty much the standard. It's kind of hard to get a type 2 light curtain. 20 years ago, when light curtains were new technology, they made something called a Type 2. It was a lot less expensive than a Type 4. It's for lower risk. Okay, mm -hmm. But operators, maintenance folks might not know that. They need to be applied properly. So that's what we find. Okay, They're mounted too close to the point of operation. Maybe when the machine started, the mounting distance was good, but a stop time measurement wasn't done every year to ensure that that, that measurement was still relevant to how quickly the machine stops. And as we know, machines wear over time, clutches, brakes, that all wears. It slows down the stop time. It means that you have to back your light curtain off. Okay. So we've got the light curtains mounted too close. Operators can reach around the light curtain to the point of operation. I think that's talking about back here. There's a big gap right here. Okay. You can also reach under here. So we want to make sure that we're putting the light curtain on, but that we're 
you'd be surprised. People figure out how to reach around stuff. They'll figure out, oh, but I gotta, gotta adjust that part if I want to call the machine it's real quick. No problem. Okay. So that's that's in violation. No stopping performance monitor. So there's nothing checking the brake to make sure that it that adequately stops. Seen this one before. No anti-tie down. So there's two buttons to start this machine right here and right here. Okay. Two hand control like this. What happens sometimes is if it's not a safety rated two hand control, you can hold one down. Five seconds later, you hit the other one. So what's the big deal? Well, people can tie something down on that, make it look like it's a hand, right? Or if it's a push button, just tie it down. That way I can still use this hand. I can put my parts in, produce parts quicker, right? All good until some until an incident happens. So we don't want that. Um, okay, upon closer inspection, here's the, the back portion of the machine. You, you, you'll notice the light curtains are protecting the front. Okay, so the back has a big opening. So that needs to be protected somehow. And it all depends on how we're interfacing with the machine, but it needs to be protected. Machine's not anchored. Okay, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but that thing's slamming down. High frequency starts doing this. Starts walking around, right? Potentially could get off balance, could fall. Okay. Non-compliant main power disconnect. So not able to properly lock out, tag out the system. Okay. That's just that's just from the outside. Then we open up the control panel. There's a light curtain there, but maybe it's wired into a PLC. I've never seen a safety switch wired into a PLC. I've seen it a lot. It happens, right? And it and and it works. Machine stops like it's supposed to. The problem is the PLC is not a safety rated device, so it could fail in an unsafe state, and I lose my safety functionality. Okay, so we look at the circuitry. This is the engineering review portion. Okay, the assessment then the engineering review is where we look at all this stuff. Okay, light curtain tied into a stop circuit on the machine control. Okay, so we just tied light curtain into the normal stop. Well, it's not safe. It's got to be monitored. Okay, there's no monitoring here, um, and it's not control reliable. Okay, meaning it doesn't it doesn't fail to a safe state, a known safe state. Okay, so here's all the recommendations we make. Here's how much it's going to cost you to fix it. Okay. So when we do our assessment, we're going to we're going to list off everything we find that needs to be remediated. In this case, it's 10,000 to 15,000 worth of safeguarding to bring it into compliance with all applicable standards. We only paid 20 grand for that machine, Chris. It's like, OK, then now we need we need to have the conversation. Does it make sense to fix it? Should we just should you guys bring in another one? But make sure when you bring in another one, depending on where you're going to get it might also not be safe right off the get go. OK, so there's just there's things to consider there, but we work through this stuff all the time, right? And we, we provide all of the business information so that we can make sound decisions on what the next steps are to move forward. OK, Do you guys want to slap, you know, maybe you guys slap some e-stop backing plates on there that takes care of that easily. You don't have to pay us to do that, right? Oftentimes, if it's a more complicated system, that's where we get involved, right? We'll talk about it a little bit more. Oh, we're going to talk about it right now. 93%. Okay, so all after, after we do our risk assessment, what happens generally, I'll have a list of like 20 machines the customer wants us to assess, okay? Eric's team goes out there, they do a bang up job, they assess it, and they find everything, everything. And they list it as a recommendation for us to fix. They list the price, okay? And they also tell us the downtime that it's gonna take for us to fix it. And they tell us the priority that those things should be fixed. Why is that important? We only have so much time and we only have so much money. Okay, we got an elephant and we want to make sure that we eat it one bite at a time. And if we do it properly, we'll get everything to 100% compliance. But we're not going to do it overnight, right? It's a process. Okay. And so the first step in the process, we get this assessment back. Now we've got this big long list of things that aren't compliant. This is where we start. To to really provide you guys with value when we get to work. We consult with you and figure out, okay, are you guys gonna take this portion on? Do you want us to take this on? And depending how complicated it is, oftentimes, so where I'm getting at is a lot of times these reports will come out and say, oh my gosh, all this stuff, right? We just start eating elephant one little bite at a time, okay? We pick out the highest priority risk. We figure out how complicated it is. 
it's not that complicated. Maybe you guys have installers that can address it. Okay, you take that piece. Cool, you got that one. What what else do we have left that is high priority? You get the idea. Okay. And then eventually, five years later, everything's 100% compliant. So that we avoid this. Uh, okay. So this is all why why are we here and why are we doing what we do and why are we paying attention to this? Okay. Avoid physical and mental anguish. Okay. Talk about the guy that loses three fingers. Okay. Maybe that was on his pitching hand and he loves to play baseball every week. You know, this has a real human, there's a human element to safety that is uh it's worth worth considering, right? Make sure we avoid that type of thing so we don't we can avoid that uh suffering. Okay. Then of course, there's the money side of things. Right. We talked about the fines, the fees. OK. We, we within that, there's also those were just fees that I showed you. There's also civil and criminal liability. Right. A lot of reasons clients rely on us. They want to make sure their assets are protected. They're making sure that we do it properly so they don't have to worry about it so they can avoid things like, well, these are big ones. The fines are big ones, but the biggest one. That one. Does anybody want to share? I don't know if it's like not proprietary, but I'm just curious. Like I've heard figures on production loss per minute. Do any of you guys, are you any of you guys hip to that or can share that? I was at a lumber mill. I heard it was like, the guy said it was like $10,000 every half an hour or something. It was, I mean, it was something crazy, right? So you think about an incident happens and you're losing weeks, right? So all that productivity, that's the real, that's the real, um, the one that hurts too. Okay. Great. Yeah. Another one that I think that doesn't always get a lot of air time up here. You talk about employee to replacement training. That's one thing if it doesn't work for me, maybe an injury or something. But I do look in places where, especially now in a workforce shortage environment, where that's a competitive advantage that you can prove to the employees that come in and that are there that you have a safe environment if they can come to work, you know they're going to go home with all the fingers and all the toes, right? That's a differentiator. It should be. It should be something that's part of your culture. Your, yep. You know, in your domain is pretty factor that you're going to provide an environment, not just to make money, right? Not just to be more productive, but to protect your most valuable assets, right? So I think that doesn't get a lot of airtime here, but it's a really, especially in the workforce, it's a differentiator. For sure. Yeah, I can see that. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, and just and just overall culture, right? And it's a lot of it's culture. And that's why you guys are here. And a lot of it is it's not just one safety guy running around being like, hey, we gotta do this, right? It's like it's a team and a culture environment. Okay. And we'll talk about that in the assessment process of how we involve the team approach to do this. Okay. And like in, when we go out and we do assessments, we always are involving the company and the players at the company, the stakeholders in the assessment itself. So that when we get the report back. And we have the recommendations. They go, oh, yeah, I remember talking. We talked about that. That would work. We talked about this, right? So nothing's done in the back of the safety. Appreciate that, Eric. And and then thirdly, it's it's the law, right? And we're not going to come in, and we're not the guys who are going to come in. Uh, or you know, we saw your machine. I'm, I'm, you know, that's not that, that's not us, okay? But it is law, and so it's 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 there for a reason, okay? Okay. So with respect to the law. Um, 1910.212 is uh, the clause in OSHA that we refer to a lot. It's machine guarding, types of guarding, one or more methods of machine guarding shall, which means it must be legally stuff, lawyer stuff, shall be provided to protect the operator and other employees in the machine area from hazards such as those created by point of operation, ingoing net points, rotating parts, flying chips, and sparks. Examples of guarding methods are very guards to hand tripping devices, electronic safety devices. The point of operation of the machine whose operation exposes an employee to injury, there again, the word shall, shall be guarded, means must. Guarding device shall be in conformity with any appropriate standards, okay? And this is where, it doesn't say that in OSHA, it doesn't say that I have to do it. Well, it, it, OSHA doesn't get specific. What It's a law, and so what they did was they pointed to the appropriate standards. And they did that very intentionally. Because OSHA is a law, it requires an acts of Congress to pass, okay? Which we all know is a super efficient place to work. And obviously they get passed all the time. They, it takes time, 
right? And so what they recognize is there's these smaller bodies, there's these boards, and many of the Omron folks sit on the boards of these standards that can update standards more frequently. So that's why they point to those relevant standards, and we'll talk about what relevant standards are, okay? Therefore, in the absence of applicable uh, standards, okay, Therefore, or in the absence of applicable specific standards shall be so designed and constructed as to prevent the operator from having any part of his body in danger zone during the operating cycle. OK. All right, cool. Let's get to the standards. So there are basically there's A standards, B standards and C standards. OK, and this is the this is the information that we use as the basis of our work. So type A standards are basic. They're high level and they're design guides. So for risk assessment, the two that you'll want to write down is ANSI B11.0 and ISO 12100. Okay, ANSI is the North American standard for risk assessment, and ISO is the international standard for risk assessment. Okay, they're starting to um, come to like more of a consensus with the, the national and international, so they're aligning those. Uh, more and more. So there's there's our elements that overlap. Uh, but there you go. And then if for Canadian friends, can you get this mouse? Oh, okay. Just checking. Uh, C1002 is the Canadian risk assessment standard. Or Z, sorry. There's no Canadians. No, 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 no. Um, okay, then. so that's the A standards. Very basic, very broad overview, general stuff. Okay. Um, I'll tell you the name of the the website if you guys need it i can find it i'm not thinking about it right now we use it eric do you know what that uh website we use to get standards off of it's called some stream and oh, text street is it, it text street text street yep. yeah textstreet.com that's where we get our standards um i think you pay a subscription it's not uh astronomical but then you have access to the pdfs if any of you guys need uh any snippets from the standards i have access to them and i can send you snips i just can't like send you full. Yeah, techstreet.com is where you could go to get your hands on all these standards and uh, all NFPA, everything. Uh, OK, and then so then there's so there's type A, which is very basic overview of risk assessment. Then there's type B. OK, and when we get into type B, there's a B1 standard and there's a B2 standard. OK, B1 standards are general safety aspects. They talk about how to apply safeguarding technologies generally. So that's where you're going to find things like how tall do my barrier guards need to be, right? Um, reach in distances, uh, you know, think things of that nature for installation of guarding. B11.19 is a B1 standard that I would write down. And ISO 13849-1 is another one that I would write down. That is principles of design. Same here. It's just the U.S. version of the principles of design and also application of, okay? And then Z432. Uh, those are all B1 standards. And then within type B, there's also B2 standards. These are not, uh, unless you guys are making your own safety equipment, which probably doesn't apply. Um, these are standards that a company like an Omron, Key and Spanner competitors would look at, right? Guys that make machine safety devices would adhere to these standards because they're specific to the devices. So they're telling us what we need to do to make our devices safety compliant. Okay, so there's one specifically for light curtains, there's one for interlocking devices, e-stops, well, and I'll show you where that applies, but we, we follow those. And then there's type C, okay? And type C is specific to the equipment that you are assessing, designing for, operating. So you should, we should always, if we're working on a hydraulic press, or working on a turret lid or a surface grinder, um, figure out is there a C standard that applies to that specific piece of machinery? And if there is, go there first. That'll have that'll have everything you need. And it's going to take precedence over these other documents. Okay, so that'll be a good place to start. Um, if there is not a specific C standard for what you're making, which many of you are pretty creative and do some cool things with automation, so you, you might not find a standard then you default to the, the general, the more general, you go one up to, to the B1 uh, standard. Okay, and then how do you know which standard you're dealing with? In the front pages of the uh, standard itself, it's 
it's within the first four or five pages. There's a, a little summary. It'll it'll say right in the front. It'll say this is a B1 standard or it'll, you know, B2. It'll tell you what it is. Any questions about that? All right. Where do you go? Where do you go to search for that has a C standard? Great question. Where do we go? Google. Where do we go, guys? We use ANSI.org. ANSI.org. Okay. ANSI.org. That's a good suggestion. I just Google. Come to come to us. If you got something specific, I've got experts I can go talk to. Yeah. I usually just Google. It's C standard. You know. Turtle. Turtle. Okay, no more questions. I think we're going to do like a. Oh, yes, sir. So when they go in and do like when OSHA goes in and assesses or fines or whatever, something that was in compliance prior to them changing something or some industry standard changing, like you almost need a full time person to like lawyer to understand. Yeah. I mean, that's. Yeah, I can shoot it. It's whole <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. I totally get so it. So what do they do they find? Because it was in compliance when they brought the machine in, but then the standards have changed or whatever. Right. They, they update them whatever yep. five to seven years or whatever. Yeah. Now they're out of compliance. So they get fined for that because they didn't Okay. So the, the yeah, so the, the answer is yes, you could, right? And the standards, so they just came out with uh 2023, they came out with uh ANSI B11.19, the new version, just this year. The last version of that, I believe, was 2016, 2017. So it's five or six years. So I, the answer is yes. If the standard changes and there's something different and now your machine is in to that, yeah, the answer is yes, you could be fine, right? The, re, the reality of it is um, the standards change about five years, so it's not like they're changing every couple of years. Um, I would have to, so yeah, it's, a thing to be right okay. a lot of the i will tell you a lot of what they're changing is not with respect to existing technologies right like they're not in my experience okay they're not saying oh well we used to say that the gates had to be this high and now we're going to make it this high in my experience more so what the standards the new standards address is new technologies okay. right now we've got um we've got safety on networks Right, so we're relying on a network for machine safety, which is awesome because it's super fast. You get way more data, but then there's now there's the network security issues. So now that's starting to to shape things. So, you know, um, I guess just sharing that it is a concern, and if it's an existing machine, there's not a huge probability that right because that technology already existed when the standard right is so. Just want to give you that sense. Um, the other thing too is when OSHA sends somebody out to do an audit, it's it's not like the machine safety specialist guy, right? It's the OSHA guy. He might he might be a specialist in machine safety. He might be a specialist in bloodborne pathogens. He might be a specialist in fall protection, right? They're just people that work for the organization. Some of them have domain expertise. Some of them are, you know, they have a little bit of knowledge about a lot of things. And so um, the reason that I'm sharing that is that it can be the case that OSHA was in here. Like OSHA was in here, they didn't say anything, right? It's like, well, that's very possible. And it's also still possible that there's non-compliant things with respect to machine guarding because it was the generalist OSHA guy, okay? What happens is if an incident happens, now they're calling on the machine safety expert. And the machine safety or whatever the incident is, it's fall protection, right? Machine safety, chemicals, spill. That expert's coming out on site and he's doing the investigation and he's going to uncover it, right? So that's how that kind of plays out. Uh, hopefully that helped answer your question. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, in short, uh, unfortunately, uh, on the other side is mostly it's new technology. So, you know, um, Not really a question, but more of a comment. Like, for example, like some of the tenants we can dash to more robotics systems. Um, the dash two is applicable to what we do mainly, but the dash one is specific for the robot designers. Um, and that, so that standard is very clear. Some of the other standards aren't so clear to supply to be as I'm using a commercially purchased power for example. 
right. or if I'm designing. Right, because we could do both. So that standard in particular is not clear. It applies to us. And sometimes there's information for both the user and the designer in the same standard. So we have a hard time. I mean, there's a lot of types of standards out there. Yeah, we have a hard time figuring out which ones are applicable. Yeah. Yeah, we can help that be sort through. And the important thing is when when it comes to so, and this is what I've learned in my time in safe to drive. Uh, and, and there's a reason for this, but it's also it's the case is document why we do what we do, what we base our work off of. And so that's an important thing to start with, right? Is to understand, okay, what document we're working on, and then we can go from there. So that's that's a big number one place to start. Um, the the important thing is that once we do that, then we're documenting everything that was done and why we use the standard we used. Guys, get back at her. So we'll do another hour. And then this this hour session is going to be all about the process, uh, the, the formal process that we're going to use to address safety. Okay. So my mentor Don Peabody has been doing this for like thirty plus years. He has this saying. He says, "A goal without a plan is a wish." Right. So we're making a goal to make things safe. This risk assessment process is our plan to get there. Okay, so we can achieve our goal. All righty. OK, so this is the first step in our safeguarding process is the risk assessment. OK, and I get I get the question all the time is. Um, everybody wants to jump to the technology and what kind of cool gadgets we're going to use, and I love it because tech is super cool, but we have to understand the performance level that we need first so that we make sure that we apply the proper technology and we make sure that we document it too because that's a huge piece of safety is making sure we document this so this hour is all about risk assessment how we do it how we document it. okay so the first step we're going to do is we're going to pick a standard to follow my man you're already on it um and you know that's an important piece right and is uh trying to pick which standard we're going to use as the basis some general recommendations that we refer to uh, ANSI B11.0, ISO 12100 for risk assessments. Again, if there's a C standard, start with that. But even in a lot of the C standards, they'll actually refer for the risk assessment portion, they'll refer back to these uh, within those C standards, or they'll just take sections of those standards and put them in to the C standard. Uh, the other piece, this is important. This is all about not being the rogue rogue uh, Indian out in the middle of the plane trying to safeguard stuff, assemble a team, okay? Get a team of stakeholders that are that are with you on implementing this safety plan. This is a huge piece, is getting cooperation and buy-in, okay? Because it's a huge part of the, that overall culture in the company of being mindful of safety. Okay, so we want to assemble a team of stakeholders. Who do we think? Ideas, people uh, from different departments, guys, that we could involve. Help me out. Controls engineers. Controls engineers. Can't forget about those guys. Management. Got to have operators. Got to have management. Yep, for sure. Probably somebody from production because he's like, don't touch my machine, dude. It's creating parts. And slow it down. Right. Okay. So, and then operators because of the information on how it actually, how machines actually get used. Okay. There's the intended use of equipment. Right. And then there's how people actually produce on it. OK, so absolutely, you're 100 percent correct. Management, operations, uh, uh, operators, maintenance people, engineers, finance people. Sometimes CEOs are involved with these financial decisions. Right? Oftentimes they are. Right. So it's not a small investment. Okay? It's an important topic of the business. OK, and then create you can create your own process. Or you can follow one that we can lay out for you, but you need we need to be mindful to create a process based on the standards and industry best practices. Some companies go above and beyond what the standards say. Some companies rely directly on the standards. Either way, this is our roadmap. Uh, is the process to get to the end goal of being safe and compliant. Okay. 
you can conduct this in house or you can enlist outside resources for support. OK, and this isn't an all or nothing game, by the way, that uh, we had a conversation, a sidebar uh, when we do this and Omron uh, is available to help. Right. Sometimes we'll do assessments and we'll come back with where we've assessed 20 machines. And like I mentioned earlier, we get a quote back. It's one point five million dollars. You can't do this. It's too much money. OK, but that again, that's where we cooperate. We figure out what you guys can do in house, what we can offload. There's probably some areas that are very simple that can be done quickly. Hey, that beast stop needs to yell left back and let it right. Um, so you can conduct it in house or you can list outside services if you enlist us. You'll also have a cooking sheet on how the safety process works, which can be helpful for future uh, future applications that you have. OK, so it's all about us understanding where you guys want to go, uh, where you want your teams to be. Are you trying to develop in-house expertise? Well, help. you just wanting us to do it. Cool. We can help with that, too. Um, OK, so. The basis of the risk assessment is to identify risk, and in order to identify risk, it's probably helpful to understand. What is risk? OK. So how do we want to, How do we quantify risk? Or what's the definition? So Marion Webster says the possibility that something bad or unpleasant, such as an injury or loss will happen. OK, we talked about all those this morning, all the loss, the injury. OK, risk is a function of. The severity of the incident. The probability. Those are the two main factors of, that play into risk. OK, severity of the hazard. And the probability. Is a, is a function of these two, the frequency of exposure to the hazard. OK, and then the technical and human possibilities of avoiding or limiting the harm. OK. So we've created a scoring system and the standards will help you uh, lay out how to create a scoring system. We've created our own that are based on these three factors and they roll up into the risk and okay, the risk scoring. Pop quiz. Okay, acceptable risk. So we talked about risk. Now we're going to talk about acceptable risk. Okay, so if we're going to guard something, we want to guard it to a level that's acceptable to us, right? So then what's acceptable? A risk level achieved after risk reduction measures have been applied. It is a risk level that is accepted for a given task or hazard. Okay, let's do an application example. A moving chain in close proximity to hands. Chain speed is 3,960 feet per minute. It's also 1,207 meters per minute. Uh, 45 miles an hour, or 66 feet per second. Is that acceptable risk? The chainsaw. Yeah. You've been to one of these classes before, or something? No. Nice. Yes. <laughs> yep. Okay. Most, I mean, our guts tell us like, no, that is not acceptable risk ever. And then you know, hundreds of thousands of these things get sold on the open market. Okay. So we so with acceptable risk, we have to we have to consider that the machine still needs to be functional, right? Now we do everything we can to protect that piece of equipment. Okay, there's two hand controls on these guys. A lot of times we'll be make sure both hands are on the chainsaw, right? If one of them's off, it won't run. They have technology now with anti-kickback technology where if you hit a knot and it kicks back, it shuts off. Okay, so there's there's measures that are taken. There's this is where we get into the hierarchy of control. There's an instruction manual. Inside the instruction manual, it probably says you have to be a certain age to operate this device. Okay, that's an administrative control. So kind of like telling guidance, right? There's stickers on it. The one with the hand and the blood thing. Administrative control. Don't put your hand here. Okay. So we're gonna we're going to attack the risk as best we can based on our priority level. But again. Uh, at some point, the the machine has to do its job. Okay, that's the point of this guy. Okay, so here's the the flow of our roadmap. Okay, so we prepare for and set limits of the assessment. How many machines are we looking at? What machines are we looking at? Let's document them with the machine inventory list. Okay, what is the life? What is the span of life of this machine that we're assessing for? 
Are we assessing for production? Are we assessing for shipment assembly? Right? How how much of the lifespan of that tear down, break down, disposal? Usually it's just production, right? But let's set the limits of our assessment. Okay, so once we have a list and the limits of our assessment, now we can go into uh, the meat and potatoes. It's identifying tasks and hazards on that piece of equipment. Okay, so we're going through and we're looking at every single task that an operator or a maintenance person does, and then we're evaluating is there any risk associated with that task? Uh, little cheat code look for things that move, right? Look for things that are hot. Things that move are usually good candidates for things that can hurt, right? Sharp things, pinch points, nip rolls. If you're having troubles, we'll I'll touch on it in a different slide. But there's an appendice in the risk assessment standard, and it gives you some like starting points of things to look for. Sometimes it's easier to see something, you're like, oh, yeah, that is there. So that helps. Um, but we're going to identify all the tasks and all the hazards. And when we do this at Omron, we come into a plant, we do this initially. In our minds, we strip all of the safety stuff off the piece of equipment. Okay, so like that works. So there's got light curtains. We just pretend they don't exist because we want a base level risk score. Okay, we're not going to assume that stuff is safe. We'll verify that later in the process. We'll talk about that. Okay, so we get our initial risk based on a risk scoring system. Then we're going to go to this hazard control hierarchy. This is how do we mitigate against that risk? Okay, we apply that. Then we assess, okay, what's the residual risk after we've applied that? We're going to score that. And then is that acceptable? If yes, move forward. Uh, there's a step missing here before validate. Is res residual risk is acceptable? Yes. Install and wire the equipment, then validate. If it's not, nope, then we're going to go back up and we're going to do it again. Okay. Okay, once we we get to an acceptable risk point, we install, we can validate our solutions. We uh, there's validation documentation that we can provide examples of. Uh, you now have a documented risk assessment, an installed safety system, and it's been validated to show that um, that all the safety sy systems are functioning as they should. There's also a verification piece. I'll, I'll touch on that. Okay. So prepare for and set the limits of the assessment. Well, I sure walked through a lot of this in that last slide. Um, okay, we talk about the team. So each and S managers, operators, maintenance personnel, engineers, electricians, production managers, specialists. Determine the scope of the assessment, right? So this is, yep, talked about that. Okay, where do I start? <laughs> I get this question sometimes like, hey, we want you to come out and do a risk assessment on our facility. It's like, no, nah, promise you don't want us to do that. Okay, let's narrow things down a little bit. You guys probably have, most companies have an idea of the machine that kind of scares them a little bit. Good place to start, right? <laughs> You're chuckling. Yeah, I was at a plant that makes uh, arrows, and there was a piece of equipment there. We got in the room, and the one dude sat at the end of the table. He goes, I don't even like walking by that machine. Right, so that's a good place to start. It's like, yeah, he doesn't even want to walk. Like, let's start there. Okay, so only assess machines in the initially, right, that have the potential of amputation or fatality. Um, assess the operation and maintenance portion of the machine life cycle. Okay, don't worry about tear down disposal. Okay, let's, we got to start somewhere. Um, identify and assess hazards only or all tasks and hazards. Provide and reduce uh, safe work procedures, control schematics. Plan and unforeseen uses of the equipment. Okay, here's our, this is right out of that appendix that I talked about when you do, when you're looking for your different hazards. And by the way, there's, there's tasks and then there's hazards associated with tasks, right? And then there's just hazards that might exist that there's no, there's no task associated. So keep an eye on for just hazards also. Uh, that's, that's a possibility. And in those cases, you don't have to document there's no task, but it's something dangerous, which I've seen before. Uh, forgive me, I'm not thinking of a specific example, but just document the hazard and then do the risk analysis on that. Okay, so you're going to document all tasks associated, um, all foreseeable use and misuse of the equipment. 
this one is always contentious, right? It's like, well, the guy jumped 10 feet to, you know what I mean? Like, he was, an un- I, I don't know, you know, it's just like, why, why would he do that? You know, and it's like, if you, if, if you have a foreseeable misuse, account for it, but, like, don't go too far down the rabbit hole, right? Um, there's, there's things that are foreseeable. Overspeeding the machine, foreseeable, right? Maybe uh, reaching into your introduction to do adjustments, foreseeable, okay? But uh, don't, I always get questions on how. It's like, yeah, people, people do some, some silly things and we can't be accountable for all of them, but let's try and at least figure out what they might do with the piece of equipment and we're good. Okay, any conditional hazards that could exist? Different temp- operating temperatures, uh, things of that nature, right? Overspeeding, things like how will the machine change over its life cycle? Okay, stop time measurements. Think about the, the, how that machine ages in the field. Okay, and yeah, and that appendix will give you a list. Okay, this is right out of ISO 13849. I really like this because it's super simple. So like, keep it simple. How do I find a performance level requirement? This is a way to do it. Okay. Are you guys, have you guys heard that word performance level requirement? Yep. Okay. No. Okay. So for the folks that haven't, a performance level requirement is basically a measure of how, I want to say how safe do we make the circuit, but how far do we have to go to protect against this hazard? Both with equipment and with the way that we wire it. That's the performance level. How does it how does it need to perform? So when we do a risk assessment, the goal is to identify what that is, what that performance level is for each one of those hazards before we design the solution. And then we're going to design a solution and we're going to verify that it meets that performance level. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Everybody's crystal clear on that one. Um, Okay, so this is a very easy way to get, very simple way to get to our performance level required. Okay, so what we have here is our three, our three factors. Severity of injury, frequency, and exposure to the hazard, possibility of avoiding or limiting harm. And then we're just gonna, we're just gonna go through this flow chart, right? So for severity of injury, is it S1 or S2? Okay, slight, which is normally reversible. Okay, um, or is it serious? I would say emergency room trips are serious, right? Everybody agree? Yep. I would say slight is like breakout. We got a first aid kit here. We got some band aids. We got some gauze. Probably slight. That's kind of how I look at that, right? But I like this because it's like it's just you know it's it's, it's easy to do. Uh, frequency and or exposure to the hazard, seldom to less often or the exposure time is short is F1, F2 is frequent to continuous, okay? So what do you think guys? Three times an hour, guys gotta access this area that has this hazard, F1 or F2? F1, F2s, okay? Three times an hour, I was thinking F2. but it could also depend if it's not very, if it's a very short amount of exposure time, could be F1. Just 13849 call out, like we, we, we build equipped, so we do risk assessments all the time. Cool. Um, but like we have definitions of slight versus serious. Like this, this is, it's, it's good because it gets you going where you need to go. Yeah, it's big. It's super big. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Um, this is directly out of 13849. Okay. Don't actually they don't break it out anymore no so if so if so uh you could use this as the basis of your scoring system and that's what we do but we actually we do the same like we break it out more so that it's not as uh you know cut and dried per se sure uh, i'll show you what our numbering system looks like good question uh, and then the possibility of uh avoiding or limiting the harm is it if if the hazard's there i'm exposed to it can i get away and not get hurt or um, is it going to happen? Am I going to get injured? Okay. So P1, P2. So we go through this chart, right? We say, okay, this is a serious incident uh, that would happen, right? It's a, it would be a serious injury. Let's say I am able to, uh, I'm only interfacing it with it seldom, like once a week. 
OK, what's the probability of avoidance? And eh, it's going to happen. OK, performance level D. So that's the PLR performance level required of your safety circuit is a performance level D. By the way, uh, cheat code, robotic systems, stuff like this that we see here, almost inevitable performance level D. Okay, most of them, I'd say like 85% are performance level D. Okay, the rest, uh, well, a, a big swath of them are performance level D. Uh, performance level E is a little more rare, um, but the majority of things that we assess are D. Okay, and we'll talk in the second half, like what that actually means when you design the equipment and how you wire it and what instruments you pick. This is our scoring sheet. So this is like where we break it out a little bit uh, differently. So we assign a score of one through 10 for the severity. For the frequency, we do one to four. And for the probability, we do one to six. So our scale goes 10 plus four plus, so that's what, 20? So we have our max is 20. Uh, so the way ours works is from zero to six, we use all three of these factors, right? And we score it, and if it's six or less, it's low risk, which is basically just like single channel safety. If it is seven to 11, we categorize it as a medium risk, which is single channel safety circuit with some monitoring, make sure that there's no failures. And if it's 12 or above, we call it high risk. And then that would be two channel redundant monitoring control circuit. Okay, that's since there. So single channel, single channel with monitoring, control reliable. And if the if this single channel, single channel with monitoring, control reliable, I don't know what that means. We're, we'll talk about what what this is referring to is how the how those line curtains are actually wired into the control system, how that all functions. Okay, just know that this up here requires uh it's redundant right more complicated wiring but it's also guarding against the more severe hazard so you see things that are less hazardous and they're less expensive on our recommendations so there's less going on right we're only wiring a single channel device versus something that's more dangerous we've got a lot more intensive equipment more wiring etc okay so for my standards folks ANSI talks in, so the ANSI B, uh, B11.0 talks in terms of this single channel with monitoring, control reliable. They talk in terms of single channel, single channel with monitoring and control reliable. That's how ANSI does it. Um, the ISO standard is they talk about performance level. Okay. And what I want you to know is that the performance level is the same as it's, it's the same it's describing the same features that the ANSI one is, but it takes it a little step forward with respect to things like it also factors in mean time to failure of the equipment. Okay. And it takes into consideration the common cost fall and diagnostic coverage. So it adds a couple of layers on top of the ANSI standard. Okay. Because the Europeans like people more than we do. Yeah, Jim. There, I had a um, customer. He was, he was Belgium. Um, they made casting equipment um, for like alloy, those alloy rims that they were doing. Um, and he would, he would, his name was uh, Dion. And he would say, "Chris, over there, we we protect against suicider." That's what he would say. All right, so they're a little little higher standard level, right? So, We'll I'll show you a little bit more on we'll do a little deep dive on the performance level. OK, so risk reduction. If the level of risk is not acceptable, feasible risk reduction measures will be implemented. OK, risk shall be reduced using the hazard control hierarchy, and I'll show you what that is. OK. So here we are. So we talked about our scoring. We know how to get the score. Now, how do we apply a solution to that piece of equipment? We follow this control hierarchy. Okay. This is why we love working with OEMs because the most effective way to avoid against the hazard, right, is what? 
yeah, eliminate it. Figure out a way to not have it interface with the operator at all. Okay. Make it go away. That's for sure going to save uh, injury, right? So the hazard's not even accessible anymore. So benefit of thinking of safety up front doesn't always happen. A lot of times we get calls after the design done. Hey, oh yeah, we need to. This thing's rocking, and we need to save it, <laughs> right? Um, so good idea to be part of the design process early on because we can use the elimination method. Uh, when we get called out onto sites, uh, we're generally going to start right here. Okay, with the second measure. So this first one is eliminate. The second one is if we can't eliminate it. Let's put some engineering controls on it right here. Okay, this is the design it out. If we can't eliminate it. Let's apply engineering controls to protect people against that hazard. Okay. Then once we implement that, if it's possible, we go down to what are called administrative controls. Remember the chainsaw, user's manual, stickers. Don't touch that. It's moving fast. It's going to cut your finger. We do that. Okay, why do we think that engineering controls would be ranked as a higher priority than an awareness means? And is. You have eliminating the hazards with barriers and you're preventing something, some element, the X factor. What's the X factor? The human part. Humans, they do dumb stuff sometimes. You know, not intentionally, okay. but sometimes they do they do silly things. So we're eliminating the human element, and that's why engineering controls is uh, above administrative controls. Okay. So we're going to design out the hazard if we can. Okay. If we can't design out, well, here's a, okay. Here's an example of designing out uh, the hazard, right? So. This is uh, a street down in Arizona. Uh, you've got an industrial facility here. There's train tracks, right? Department of Transportation has done a sufficient risk assessment and found that, you know, there's traffic in the mornings when this industrial park folks are coming into work. It's probably a little traffic at lunch, probably more traffic in the afternoon. Frequency of the train crossing, they decided that these awareness means are sufficient based on the risk level. Okay. This is designing out that hazard, right? Higher frequency, okay, more risk. They just they took the measure to design that out. Same train track, just put an overpass there, okay? And we're going to jump down. I'll talk about, so this afternoon is going to be, we will talk about the technology that we apply once we've got our hazards all assessed and figure out what we want to, what we want to apply as our engineering controls. We're going to skip that for now and we're going to go down to administrative controls. These are things like awareness means, right? So lights, beacons, uh, forklifts driving through. You Sometimes you'll see spotlights on the ground. It's an awareness means. You're walking by and you're like, what's that? Oh, it's a forklift. Oh, okay, right? Lights work. I like the lighting personally because I think lights draw your eyes. Um, just, I don't know, it's just natural. It's like, oh, red light. Okay, you know, it's something like instinctual. Uh, Computer warnings, signs and labels, beepers, horns, sirens. That's all awareness means stuff. Okay, training and procedures, training your folks, right? We do that when we install, when we install our engineering controls, we make sure the operators means people are trained. Okay. So we're gonna shore up, we're shoring up anything here with our administrative controls. And so you can see that applying safety is a combination of all these things. The last one is uh, personal protection equipment. Okay, safety glasses, face shield, earplugs, gloves, protective footwear, respirators. Okay, everybody always wears those, right? Steel toed shoes. Dad never wore, it was like dad never wore respirator masks by the way when he was painting. You know, he's had these like just Bondo burgers flying out. It was just like, seriously, dad, like, take care of yourself, please. Right? Thanks. Fun memories. Uh, effective awareness means. Here we go. Caution. This sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edges of this sign. Also, reach out. Okay. Not super effective. How many of you guys? 
have seen one of these and they fire off and you're like, oh, I got this Boop, right through. OK, or seen somebody do that. OK, awareness means not the most reliable. And then, of course, nobody in this room has ever run a red light, right? Never happened. OK, so that, so we apply those things to, to shore up the engineering controls and to design it up, right? They help, but they're relying on humans. And so we don't want to use that as the primary. And I see that all the time. It's like, do we put a chain in front of that thing? We put a sign there that says this is super dangerous. Don't mess with it. We're good. Like, no, you're not. <laughs> like, you know. Uh, so here we go. Effectiveness of training. Okay, we all train the forklift operators for training. Let's train this guy. All right, let's get started. Let's get started on this rewiring. Oh, rats! I forgot to lock out that panel. Oh, I'm not going all the way back there. I don't have time. It's all the way across the room. I got work to go. I just finished this real quick. Quick job. No one ever goes to that box anyways. Here's some. Here's uh, Buddy, his friend. Hey, just noticed that switch was off, so uh, I turned it off. Turned it on for you, right? Okay, effectiveness of PPE. We've all been there. We're working. Boss comes to check out what's going on. How's it going, guys? <laughs> guys, up to you. All right? I didn't have to see that. Just think full of. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of Rodney Dage, the look on his face. And what's going on, guys? Okay, so, so that's why we don't use the word uh, administrative controls as our primary go-to. Okay, it's design it out, engineering controls that shore it up with engineering controls. Then that's then you're there. Okay, um, once we use our scoring system, we're going to assess the residual risk. Once risk reduction measures have been so selected, the residual risk shall be assessed. Okay. Uh, residual risk shall be assessed to verify that the selected measures, including training and PPE, are appropriate for the application and that they effectively reduce the risk. Okay, hazards that present higher risk of harm should not be addressed using less preferred risk reduction measures. This is the, and like I see it all the time. It's like we didn't have time to do it, we just put a sign, right? This is that's what that's all about. Okay, um, that, that should not be done unless no other solution is feasible. It says B11.0, section 6.5.1. Okay. It's not in OSHA, but OSHA says to look at the standards. And that's what the standards say. Okay, use the same process and scoring system as the initial assessment with the consideration of implemented risk reduction measures to reduce severity and or probability. Okay, and this is, uh, by the way, when we do our uh, risk assessments, we have a uh, this is where we would do what's like a gap analysis, where we, somebody else has already installed some stuff. And we'll gap analysis and make sure that that recommendation, that installation, does meet uh, the appropriate performance level. Okay. Okay, and then we ask ourselves: Is the acceptable risk obtained? And it may be a company standard that you guys that, that you guys roll out, right? You may you may have your own safety standard that says. Hey, everything that we assess and then we remediate, we need to have a residual risk score of X or below, right? Every piece of equipment. Uh, it could be something some and different companies differ, right? And it could also vary based on application as we saw. Um, so once the residual risk has been established for each hazard, a decision shall be made to accept the residual risk or to further reduce it. Let's put a second set of light curtains on there, guys. Super dangerous, category four, control reliable. But I think we should put another set of light curtains on it just to be doubly sure. Does that bias me? Two safety, two extra. No, it doesn't. No, because the type four category, the type four safety solution is 100%. So it, it, it's not going to bias anything. Okay. Team determines if, it, if the acceptable risk is achieved. Okay, the decision to accept tolerate risk is influenced by many factors, including culture, technological, and economic feasibility of installing additional risk reduction measures, the degree of protection achieved through the use of additional risk. 
Yeah, the degree of protection achieved through the use of additional risk reduction measures and the regulatory requirements for best industry practice. Okay. So proposing, so this is basically a critical assessment process and so present acceptable risk reduction system to the stakeholders. Okay. When I see stakeholders here, I'm thinking when we get our design done, we want to make sure everybody's on board and particularly the people that use the equipment. Okay, we don't want to just come in, design something because we think it needs to be des designed this way and that's the way it's going to be. And then three months later, the door interlock disappeared. Magic, right? Uh, our safety system has been defeated. Uh, it's not functioning properly. Uh, that's that's the key there is uh, bringing the stakeholders in. Okay. Okay, so there's a way that uh, when we do our risk assessments, this isn't called out in the standards, but when we talk about this, the kind of the collaboration, um, when we do our risk assessments and we, we outline all of our recommendations for you on what needs to be done, we also document that in a Visio drawing, drawing. We call it the plan view drawing. Really helpful to do. And I would recommend that if you guys are doing your own, that you implement something similar. It doesn't have to be for the risk assessment. It's not wildly detailed. But what it does have is it has illustrated every recommendation that we give, the location, and a little key showing you exactly what recommendations were made. Okay, and on this drawing, whatever new equipment is being proposed is in color, and whatever existing equipment is uh, is black and white or is grayed out. Uh, this is really cool and helpful because it gives you a workable document you can put on the production floor, and you can say, "Here's what we've decided we're going to do with this piece of equipment." You have three weeks. If you have any thoughts, concerns, comments, please let us know. Uh, but it's an opportunity to collaborate. Okay. Also serves as a very helpful tool for a yearly audit. Did the safety interlock that got proposed exist? Did this existing interlock that existed right here two years from now is that still there? Go check, check, check. Okay. Emergency stop interlock, existing interlock. Are all those things still there? That's a good yearly audit procedure. Okay, yeah, good document to use for that. Okay, the last piece after it's been installed is to validate. Okay, so this is a very important piece. And whenever a customer, we, we whenever we get a risk assessment report back, and they tell me like, "Hey, uh, we want you to do this machine because it's super complicated, but we're going to do this one." Because we got it in house, um, I always am. I'm cool with that. Like, I don't need to have all your business. Like, if you guys have a resource, let's team up. Let's get it done. But what I do recommend is that you that we validate what you've done. Okay. So then that way you've got the assurance that what you implemented is correct. Okay. And in that case, uh, then you have the ability to know for sure that you're good to go. That we signed off on. Okay. So what do we do when we validate the solution? Uh, we test all the safety systems. We look at ensuring that all the mounting distances are appropriate. Look at the administrative controls, uh, review risk assessment documents, safety circuits, and validate that all of that stuff is uh, compliant with what it needs to be uh, based on making this machine safe and compliant. Then you get a document that says, yep, it's been validated. You're good to go. Okay. There's the machine sign off form. Do you recommend doing that on a regular basis afterwards? Good question. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like a yearly audit type of situation. Uh, every year, two years. I was saying, sure something was the bypass. Correct. This is where that, uh, sorry, sir, I forgot was me. Right, Brian, this is where when those standards change, right? If you're doing like a yearly audit or every three years, have somebody validate because that would uncover any of those things that you're seeing. Validation efforts not a huge effort. It's depending on your machinery. Okay. But yeah, that, that would be, yeah, and that's the way that would cover any updates in the standards. There's also, do you do any work on the machine if you're pretty low the machine? Probably. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The machine's all moving and playing the same. Probably your balance and make sure, or it could be not. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So anytime the machine moves, anything that's been added or removed, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, lots of documents. It's all about the documentation, guys. We're going to do the right thing. No, you're going to do the right thing. Let's make sure that we're documenting it so that everybody knows the right thing is done. Because if we do that, number one, we're probably going to catch any of the I's that we didn't dot or T's that we didn't cross. But, you know, God help us if something happens, here's the documentation. This is why we did it this way. Okay, very important piece. Okay, and then this is why we have this here, because it's an important piece. Annex H of ANSI B11.0 has some examples of the documentation. Um, and it tells you at minimum what needs to be included in your risk assess assessment documents. Okay, uh, I have a sample risk assessment that I can share with you. Uh, it's a generic form. It's got all the information you need. Feel free to use that as a cookie cutter like baking sheet. Um, you can also develop your own. And then we have the assessment template to, to give to you guys as well. Uh, pretty basic stuff though, right? Date of the assessment, risk assessment team, limits of the assessment. Uh, Identifying the machine inventory that we're doing our assessments for. I won't go through all of it, but you get the idea. This is what can happen if we don't do an assessment. Just start throwing safety stuff at it, right? The OSHA cowboy. So he's got some flip down sunglasses, automatic high volume. Whoa. There's some administrative, some awareness means there. 180 rear view mirror headlights. Prescription safety goggles, EPA emissions control system, like that part. <laughs> okay, pretty hard to rope steer, though, I would say. So, this is why we want to make sure we, we just get a plan down. Okay, here's the benefits of the risk assessment ensure all hazards are reviewed and addressed, help select proper guarding tech, reveal the risk level and the safety related control system needed. For compliance, document documented assessments show or can prove compliance with the standards. So if you ever get into a situation where you need to show, yep, here's the risk assessment you did on that piece of equipment, can help create the risk reduction strategy and helps to ensure the guarding is done right the first time. That's a big one. This is the whole like safety world in a nutshell. It's like we do it right, do it right the first time. Yet it's going to require some effort. It's going to require some investment. And we're not ever going to have to worry about it again. Okay. And in the long term, we're we're uh, grateful that we did that that way. All right. I want to show you guys. We have just a quick. Okay. So I just want to show you guys this. Uh, a quick ten minutes. Um, this is our sample risk assessment document. Okay. We just did it for good old ABC Company. Good good guys down there in somewhere California. Uh, machine and process safeguarding assessment report. Okay. I'm going to go through this, but here you go. So machine detail. So we give the uh, this is the, the limit This set the limits of the uh, assessment. So we provide machine detail, machine type, model number. OK, we say which standards we're referencing right there. And we highlight what the e-stop requirements are, and then we just put an image of that machine. OK, what machine, what location? OK, here's our risk evaluation template or hazard evaluation. OK, so if it's a machine with multiple hazard zones, they will be a page for each hazard zone. This is just an example. So we have one hazard zone, which is the point of operation. This is a it's an old punch press, as you can see here. OK. So we give our description of all of our tasks. We list out all of our hazards and then we do our scoring. Okay, and we come up with our score of 14 or high. And then we define what that means in terms of a performance level requirement. OK, all good and necessary. OK, and then we also provide a piece from ISO 13849. These are the categories of compliance. OK, so we go through each category and we will tell you, is it compliant or is it not compliant? And if it is not, we will we will indicate why. OK, we're not going to tell you what to do about it yet. We're just telling you why it's not compliant. OK, then this is the piece where we get into, OK, here's what we recommend. OK, this sample doesn't have the recommendations, but the way that I see them most often 
is we get numbered recommendations. So it'll be like one through 10, one through 15. And then those numbers will correspond to our plan view drawing. Okay. So it would, in a, for an example, would be number one, you'd have a number one right here. And you read that recommendation, it would say install safety rated type four light curtain. Okay. Just high level stuff. We're not going into how the machine, how we're going to interface to the control system. We're not going into any of that. We're just doing a high level. Here's what you would need. Okay. And then one other piece, and then there's your legend uh, down below. Okay. One other piece that we do, and this is a piece that gets uh, done in the field when we're doing the assessment, your your uh, stakeholders are walking around with our assessor. The assessor goes, yeah, we're going to we're we're going to recommend this, this, this. And then your your person says, oh, we got a guy that can do that part. OK, under recommendations, that assessor can then put that under customer to furnish items. So that's a piece that uh, would, would then modify that proposal for the work that we're going to propose. OK, hey, we can we can we're good. We can put hard guards up. Right. So my only caution with that. Is that uh, when that happens, we're going to come out and revalidate it, right? And so if it's not done properly, we're going to find that. Then we're going to have to change it. Then we're going to have to have you change it, come out and revalidate it, right? So there's a little risk there, but if you're comfortable with it, we're we're confident that you you know you're good. Uh, but we'll come out and revalidate it. Okay. And then so that's when we propose a risk assessment. That's a big part of what your money is going towards. Is that report? OK, which you can then keep on file. And then the other thing, and this is really where the the decision making and the planning can happen is on this side. If I can. Beautiful. OK. Um, a lot of times when we do a big I got like six minutes, but uh, we get everybody to launch. A lot of times when we do a big plant OK, and we get this risk assessment back and it's 415 pages and like you're just so excited to read those 415 pages. It's just like, man, I've been waiting to read through how how I'm wrong to this, <laughs> right? All the information's there. We don't want to, we don't want to, it's, yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot to go through. So what we do is we, we summarize all of that data in this spreadsheet, super helpful, and we provide some additional uh, information for you. I just wanted to show you this as another important deliverable for when Omron does the assessments. What we put here is we have all of our, each row is a specific machine that we've assessed. Here's our page number on the risk assessment document that that machine starts, okay, where the information on that machine starts. This is all kind of like logistics information. What is it? Serial number, where is it located? And then this is the, the real heart of the piece right here is we pull out for each piece of equipment, we take the highest score risk that we found, okay, and we pull that out and put it here. And then gave us these multipliers. They're like, uh, how do I explain this? They're like multipliers of, uh, let's call it risk. So we take that highest level risk score, we multiply it across each category of compliance for that piece of equipment, okay? And once we do that, we get a number here. We call that number the priority score. So the way that we came up with that, we know that this is where the the mathematical folks get involved. Statistics being, if the point of operation or perimeter guards are not compliant, the probability of incident is higher. So the multiplier is weighted heavier, right? Versus dropout protection, okay? If the machine loses power, and then all of a sudden the machine gets power, how does it start? Does it start in the safe state, or does it just start, robots just start flying, right? Okay. Obviously dangerous, obviously not a condition we want, but how often do we just randomly lose power on a robotic system, right? Probably not very much. How often does, you guys got the point, how often does a machine operator interface with the point of operation of the hazard? Very frequently. So statistically speaking, more probable an incident will happen there. So we've given it a heavier multiplier than some of the other areas. And obviously if it's compliant, it doesn't factor into that probability. But this priority score is really helpful because it can now inform us on our time and our resource, which is the most valuable thing, right? We want to work on things that are impactful. We do that by working on the things that are high priority, 
And hopefully now you guys understand how we're defining and recommending to you what we say is the highest priority hazard to start working on. Does that make sense? Okay, I'll, I'll, I can't share the math behind it with you, right? But what I will say is that the point of operation and perimeter guards is the heaviest weighting category. So if that flips to a yes, that 12 would probably drop to about four. Okay, just give you a kind of a, a feel for things. So that's really super cool. And then the other piece, of course, right, that plays into the decision is the money part, right? So the, the, this is what you would also get out of a risk assessment, which is the budget. It's a, it's a budget for our initial recommendations. If we were to do it turnkey, which is option A, if you have just, hey, you guys take care of it, we're good. Um, or option C is we do the engineering behind it. We provide you guys the materials and off you go. So we give you two budget options there. And then we're also going to we're going to um, inform you about downtime, estimated total downtime. OK, that's really important. Obviously, it's usually one of the big ones. We've got to schedule this in a downtime situation. How much how long are you going to take the machine down? Um, and we tell you how long it's going to take us without barrier guards. We tell you how long it's going to take us if we're going to install the barrier guards. So look at this top one up here. What does that tell us about those that set of recommendations? It's without barrier guards, it's 160 hours. With barrier guards, it's 405 hours. What does that tell us about? Any ideas on what the recommendations are there? I would say it's a lot of hard guarding, OK? Because the without barrier guards labor, that's basically electrical right programming that sort of stuff okay so those are those are areas we can work together but anyways wanted to just kind of give you an idea of you know the what what we're doing how we're doing it when we look at assessments but then we go from there and this then we start to strategize on on how we approach things and like my friend uh sorry your name again ryan cool um like Ryan was explaining is, you know, it can be the case where we get a budget back and it's huge. Like this is where we go to work. We figure out what can you guys do in house? What can we do? What are the most critical systems? Um, and that's where that's where we do good work, you know, and at minimum we do something. Because doing something's better than doing nothing. Okay, and I can't tell you how many times and I've seen this happen before. Uh, get a call from your customer. Goes on a name, say who. Hey, we had an incident. We've got to get you guys out here. We've got to get this stuff assessed. Somebody got hurt. Need help, right? I go in my file. We were there in 2018, five years ago, and we assessed that piece of equipment. Uh, you know what I mean? It's just like, uh, okay, we'll come out and we'll reassess it because it's been five years. So things might have changed. But I guess my message is, is if we're gonna assess stuff, let's create a plan. Let's move forward with it. Uh, and get things fixed. So that is the first two hours, guys. Um, I appreciate you hanging in there. We're going to get some lunch. The next two hours are going to be all about now that you guys have seen how performance levels get identified, how risk assessments are done. We're going to talk tech, so that should be pretty fun. We've got some guys in here that are super familiar with technology. Hopefully, answer your questions. Uh, I, I'll really focus on with the tech. It's uh, when do we specify what. And then based on the performance level, how do we integrate that into a safety circuit so that it meets that performance level that we need? This second half is going to be all about the application of engineering controls and solutions. Now that we've got our risk assessments done, and you guys are all risk assessment experts by now, every one of you. Uh, we will learn how to then apply safeguarding technologies, learn how to do it properly so that we meet uh, the requirements of our risk assessment. Can somebody help me out? Anybody remember uh, one of one of the things that comes out of a risk assessment on the outputs? Thank you. That was the one I was looking for. I appreciate that. What other outputs come out? What are we doing in a risk assessment? Residual risk. Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, identifying residual risk. Yep. Okay, really good. Recommendations. Okay, the recommendations on what we're going to do. When we do it, we give you a budget, right? You guys might not have that as an output, but performance level, for sure, output. 
residual risk for sure output. Okay, good stuff. Just a little review. All right, so we're gonna go a little deeper into this performance level and how do we meet the requirements that we've now spelled out and found out in this risk assessment. So does anybody remember this diagram here? Hierarchy of control. Okay. Of course, we're going to design things out if we can. Uh, then we the next piece I told you we were going to skip over and save for the second half is now we're here. We're in engineering control. So I can't design it out for whatever reason, whatever design constraints I have. So now I need to apply engineering controls to do some guarding. Okay, so some examples here of uh, what constitutes an engineering control. Guards, like big fencing, protection, keeping people out. Uh, those are categorized as both, both fixed and movable. Okay, for movable guards, the standards require that we monitor any movable guard. And we do that with these devices here, interlocking devices. So we've got mechanical, non-contact, locking, non-locking, see any hanging out, but I don't know. Might be one on that Yaskal. Yeah, it might be one on the top of interlock device. I have some images of them too. Okay. Um, other examples: present sensing devices, things like light curtains, area scanners, and safety mats. Those, is that, those devices sound familiar? Yep. Okay. And then, of course, we have two-hand control enabling devices and some alternative methods. So, all examples of engineering controls that we can deploy uh, in order to mitigate against risk. Okay. Okay. We talk about performance levels, uh, and you remember we we talked about a little bit of the difference between ANSI with the single channel, single channel with monitoring, dual channel redundant, right? That's how they spell out the circuit or circuit requirements, and ISO spells it out in terms of performance level, which goes a couple steps beyond uh, just simply the architecture of the circuit. This category here is referring to the architecture. So it could be one, two, three, or four. That's right out of ANSI, okay? And ISO adds on diagnostic coverage and mean time to uh, failure of each of the device. So it incorporates the uh, US standard, but it also adds a couple of layers of requirement to the safety circuit to uh, yield the performance level, okay? And this is a chart right out of ISO 13849. And it's a, it's a way to determine um, and calculate the performance level of a safety circuit. OK, there's also a, a, a software tool to do this. Um, it's called Sistema. You guys familiar with that software tool? That's a software tool that will calculate performance level for you. Uh, or you can do it by hand, which is like what they teach in the TUV training. We go through and do it by hand. It's like reminded me of college like. Uh, Calculus, right? Like there's calculators that can do it, or you can do it by hand. Um, what we look at with performance level, we, we have to look at the category first. Okay. So you can see here if we have a category three system, it's got a diagnostic, diagnostic coverage that's low and it has a low mean time to failure, then we're going to be at performance level B. You see a big difference. This mean time to dangerous, mean time to fit dangerous failure. That's what that D stands for. You can see there's a big difference in the performance level. If you go from a low MTTFD to a high, it takes that same exact circuit up to a performance level D. Okay. Any questions on this guy? Yes, sir. If you're looking to expect it, so I always can't always find the mean time to failures in those didn't a lot of Meetings. Yes. So, is there any good recommendation that try to interpret what do you think that is? Is not present. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so I will tell you that um, electric or uh, mechanical devices don't publish an MTTFD. They publish what's called a B10D, which is like a mechanical life of that. And that, and then the mean time to failure is going to be dependent on how often the life is, right? So sometimes if you're not seeing MTTFD, you might need to look for B10D and then um, calculate the MTTFD on your own based on how often you're using it. Um, so keep that in mind because that one snagged me before. I'm like there's no MTTFD data. It's like, oh, it's a mechanical device. You're going to use it all the time every day, or you're only using it once a week for right. 
So keep that in mind. So if you can't find MCTFD, if it's mechanical, then go to B10D and do that calculation. And then um, for things like light curtains, um, electrical devices, generally you can go to the manufacturer for MCTFD data. If you can't find it there, uh, I believe the standard has a appendix which has like general MTTFD information for types of equipment, uh, but I would rely on the manufacturer first. Okay, since you buy everything from Omron, just give me a call. Uh, I'll hook you up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Systema, that software tool has a lot of that safety data for each device within it, right? So there's, and manufacturers have libraries that they upload into Systema. And so we have a library that we upload. Good question. question. That one caught me early on too. This guy called me, is asking for MTTFD. I was like, oh, we don't have it, I guess. So, all right, what I want to do is, uh, I want to just kind of show you high level what, what the difference is between a category B circuit and a category four circuit, just to kind of get your mind around the level of depth of what's required of the actual circuit architecture. Uh, and this is going to correspond to the risk level, right? So you'll kind of see how this how this plays out. So for the non electrical engineering people in the room, myself included, um, circuit diagram, right? We've got positive voltage, negative voltage, or I'm sorry, ground down here. Here's a start button, a stop button, okay? Limit switch that's attached to a door. There's a coil to a contactor. That coil controls these contacts that then power up this motor that has some hazard spinning around on it, okay? So here's my, this is my device that I'm powering that is causing a hazard. And then here is uh, the coil that powers that device. Okay, it could be a motor, could be uh, whatever. It's mostly it's uh, mostly motors or what's causing hazards. I said things that are moving, uh, but that's what we're using in this case. Okay, so category B, single channel. Okay, and by the way, the safety circuit. I want to uh, point out the safety circuit is comprised of the safety input the logic of the safety circuit and the output of the safety circuit. And the safety circuit is, is intended to be on top of the existing machine control. Okay, and I'll, I'll kind of have some other graphics to, sh to, to show you this. Um, but the machine control could be considered as the start and the stop. Okay, the safety circuit is the input. There is no logic in here. It's direct logic. It's just this opens, that shuts off. So it's input, output. Okay, so input, output. Okay, so we've got a single channel. You, door closes, limit switch closes, powers up this contactor. These things close, motor starts spinning, dangerous stuff starts happening. Okay, that's category B. Basically, it says is uh, says category B. It sh this is directly out of the standards. Um, this shall be designed, constructed, selected, and assembled and confined in accordance with the relevant standards and use basic safety principles for the specific application intended to withstand expected operating stresses, okay? The maximum performance level achieved with this category, right? If we have a really high MTTFD and we have a really good diagnostic coverage, is performance level B. Um, we don't see category B a lot. It, very, it implies very low risk situations, right? Where a performance level B is required. But basically all the standards say is, put stuff on there that's not gonna fall off and break. That's it. Don't have to monitor anything if this limit switch goes bad nobody knows okay so you can see there's not a lot going on in terms of uh safeguarding that okay this is category one you guys see the difference there what just happened do you notice this change right now i have a that arrow with a circle around it you guys know what that stands for okay that stands for positive force guided which is a feature of a safety rated device. So literally all that changed in the circuit is I took that limit switch and I replaced it with a safety rated limit switch. Okay, it's to meet category one. And that's right here. Shall be designed and constructed using well-tried components and well-tried safety principles. This is safety talk, well-tried components and well-tried safety principles. That's like safety talk for use safety rated devices on your circuit, okay? 
I would encourage everyone, regardless of performance level, to always use safety rated inputs, safety rated logic, if there's any logic happening with the with what that input controls and safety rated outputs. I just recommend that as a base level because it keeps us out of trouble. Um, but at a minimum for category one, you have to use safety rated components. And so we're seeing it here. OK. Uh, maximum performance level achievable is a performance level C. That's if all those other factors are really good. OK. Still single channel. Like if this thing, if this thing were to weld shut, right? Uh, we would never know it. There's nothing monitoring that. Okay, so it's a sync. This is single channel, no monitoring. This corresponds to that zero to six, that low risk. Okay, what happened there? Hey, do you see what happened there? We added this little guy, the safety relay. Okay, machine control didn't change. Start, stop. This is, by the way, is an auxiliary contact off of this contactor. Okay, so we still have our safety rated input. Okay, we still have our single output. And now we have this little safety relay here. Any idea what that's doing? Yeah, exactly. Making sure all the conditions are met. Spot on. It's monitoring things. So what is it monitoring? It's monitoring this input. Okay, and it's monitoring this output, which this, by the way, is an auxiliary contact taken off of this contactor that controls the power to the hazard. So what the safety rated controller is doing is it's basically making sure that things are switching, functioning in the safety circuit as they should. And if, and if they're not, it's going to throw an alarm and it's going to uh, shut the safety, shut the system off until, until you address that problem. Okay. That's category two. And we can actually meet the performance level D with the category two uh, circuit. Okay. So this is so this guy is single channel. We talk single channel, single channel with monitoring. Okay. Medium risk. Dual channel redundant. Okay. You guys see what changed there. Now we have two inputs, each individually wired to the safety relay. So in other words, if something happens on this contact where this opens, but this doesn't, he's going to detect that. We have two outputs. So if one of them fails to open, the other one's going to open and remove power. And we're monitoring both of them. Okay. That's a dual channel redundant safety system with monitoring. And that's for anything that's high risk. So this is where, yes, sir. Does it, does it call out anywhere as far as like resetting? Because this is an auto resetting circuit. It doesn't have an actual, like, is there? That's a, yeah, that's a any great verbiage in there that says calls out something as far as like having a, a falling edge signal. Yeah, that's a great question. So as far as resetting goes, um, if there's ever anything that you can pass through, you need to have a like a physical reset happen. Uh, this could be, yeah, an auto reset where it's like a guard door where you're opening it, you're reaching in, uh, you're closing it. The, the system would need a start signal at minimum. But yes, a reset is an important piece and most often required. This example doesn't have to reset. It's okay. just start or stop. So you're exactly right. This is an auto reset, basically. Um, and let's see. So category three looks a lot like category four. The main difference between category three and category four is this feature here where the accumulation of undetected faults is taken into account. Okay, for category three, if we have a situation where there are multiple faults, it could very low probability, but it could defeat the safety system. Okay, category four will protect against that. Okay, so it's a, it's it's another level. Okay, again, very very low probability that happens, but in a high risk situation. Uh, that's that's what category four is uh, going to buy you. It will detect the fault immediately. OK, category three, you might not always detect the fault immediately. You might only detect it when you go to open that specific door. Yes, sir. So can you uh, like give an example of what like an actual system that would distinguish between those two? Like 
How, how is it? Yeah, it's for sure. Yeah, I can. Just the other. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hop because why not? Then I'm gonna hop back. It's gonna take a minute, but I think this is a good one. Okay. Let's do on this one. <laughs> okay. Safety input device, right? Safety logic controller, safety output device. Okay. Um, I'll need your help here. I'll need your imagination. But let's say we put two of these in series. Okay, so we got one here and we got one here. Okay. So now you can imagine that these two set of sets of contacts are also right here. Okay. This is channel A going through. Remember, there's an interlock here going through this interlock, that interlock back to channel A, right? Channel B, this interlock, this interlock back to channel B. So we have two in series. Okay. If a fault were to happen here on these contacts, and I open the, these channels, okay? This controller, channel A, channel B, it sees that channel A open, channel B opened. Good to go. Logic tells the motor to stop. I'm good. Close the actuator down. These contacts close again. There was a fault here that happened. We did not detect it. Then later, again, low probability, but, you know, possible. This contact fails. Now I go to open this actuator. What happens? Safety circuit fails. Because these contacts are welded. So in a case where so at practically, if you have a safety controller and you have multiple input switches for doors, daisy chain. If they're electromechanical like this, you could then have this condition, which is called fault masking, which means that the accumulation of faults could lead to the loss of the safety function. Did that kind of illustrate that for you? Yeah. OK. Um, keep in mind, there are, with newer technologies, Omron offers them, other manufacturers offer them. They offer um, interlocks that you can daisy chain. And it actually says in the sales literature that you can daisy chain these and still meet performance level E. Okay, Those products don't apply to this fault masking. But that's where that's where the difference is. Here's here's a scenario where that can't happen. OK. In this scenario, let's let's use this scenario. In this scenario, it can't happen because if a fault happens here and I open this, this doesn't open that opens safety controller goes nope, fall immediately. OK, that's the difference. So that would be category four. And then like my old, uh, my old boss is my manager. Whenever I would get safety calls as an application engineer working in inside sales, he'd just go just spec a category four and sell it. Just don't worry about it. <laughs> right. And that's, and that's totally a valid response. <laughs> if, if I just spec category four, am I good? Yes, you are for sure. However, I would say document that you did it that way intentional right because the documentation is is very important so i want to show intentionality when regarding the studies okay cool so that's the that's the electrical piece any questions on categories so we got b one two three and four they correspond to performance levels there you go so i will say that this uh, information that i just gave you after we work, now we're going to go through the actual hardware. We'll start talking about what to specify to guard things when. Okay. What you'll see is that many of those things are still configured and wired the same way based on that example circuit. Okay. The process of calculating the features of that circuit in Sistema, that is the safety portion piece that we refer to as verification. Okay. And so 
in the safety process, there's the risk assessment, right? There's the design, what we're working on now, designing this thing. Then we have to verify it. I know it's a lot of redundancy, guys, but we got to make sure that we calculate and verify that our design meets the performance level that was defined in the risk assessment. And that effort is an engineering effort, and it's the verification, and that's what all of this is. So it's cool stuff. It's double checking, triple checking, and then, of course, documenting. Yep, we designed it, and we did the performance level calculations, and system said, boom, performance level D. That's what we found in our risk assessment. Good to go. All right. Okay, so how should we go about um, well, we'll go to the control hierarchy to identify how we mitigate risk, but where and when do we select different types of guarding methodologies? Like when our assessors go out and they say, hey, you put this there to guard that, what informs them of uh, what to uh, recommend? Oftentimes, the easiest way to do this is to think about the frequency of access that the operator is going to have into the hazard. Okay, so if it's a very low uh, frequency of exposure, uh, we'll talk about what we generally would recommend. Okay, I'm not going to go through all that. It's really wordy. All right. So for a very low frequency of exposure, okay, this is stuff that we're not going to need to get into often. We generally recommend a fixed scar. Okay, so fixed scars are fixed. They're not designed to be moved, removed, taken off. Any of that, they're designed to be put in place and remain in place. Okay, they're affixed to or around the machine or tooling in such a manner as to enclose all or part of the point of operation or other hazard area. We're going to make them difficult to remove. So, i.e., not just a Phillips screwdriver, but there might be some um, special, it doesn't have to be exotic, but we're not going to make it easy to remove. So, I'll see this all the time. This is one of those easy fixes, by the way, in our assessment reports. Replace all um, fixed guard fasteners with tamper proof fastenings. I see that one like all the time on our recommendations. Basically, means if you got Phillips screwdriver stuff, for, you know, guarding a or fastening a fixed guard, you change it out. My rule I like to use is uh, make it something that is not on leather. Okay. So, like socket head cap screw, uh, square screwdriver, you know, God knows when you need one of those, you can never find it. Um, so something like that. Utilize fasteners that are retained or captive. That's just a recommendation. Is it uh, fixed guards are going to be removed from time to time infrequently for servicing? So a recommendation is, you know, make a retained or captive fastener so that when that fixed guard goes back into place, it doesn't get fastened with three of the four uh, fasteners that were on there. Because if that happens, there's a possibility that the next time it gets serviced, two out of four make it on right um must not present a hazard to on its own seems pretty obvious uh if we put a fixed guard on there let's make sure that ergonomically it's not going to create a hazard and then you know this is a really good acronym around under through or over auto think about can can the operator reach around under through or over whatever to to reach the hazard and if they can we have to guard against that it seems kind of like obvious and a little bit um, unnecessary, but I've been on plants and I've, I've been walking with our assessor once and the assessor was going, like, that gate's not high enough. And I'm not joking. I was thinking to myself, like, there's no way anybody's going to ever reach over that. And I'm not kidding you. Somebody like two minutes later came over, reached over and grabbed a jam out of the line. And I was like, okay, yep, they do that. <laughs> so if you can reach around it, under it, through it, or over it, we gotta guard it because uh, folks are gonna reach in there. Okay, everybody break out the gotcha stick. We're gonna do a little hands on technical demonstration. Maybe that can pull too. Are you guys familiar with this gotcha stick? Okay. So, this is the tool that you can uh, leave the class with that uh, will. Provide you with a device you can poke your coworker with in the cubicle and annoy them. Um, or you can go on site and you can test your fixed guards, your movable guards to make sure that the mounting distance is appropriate. Let me grab one. And let's see if I can remember the way it works. Oh, and if I can't remember the way it works, 
Or if I tell you the way it works and you forget, turn the handy dandy uh, little instructional uh, visualization here for you. Um, but really super simple. The yellow part is our North American standards. The orange is following international standards. Okay, we're American. We're going to use yellow. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is basically designed to model the anthro anthro big standards for uh, an average finger and arm shoulder. Okay, so all we're going to do is we're going to take our our gotcha stick. We insert it into a fixed or movable guard, and the orientation is going to be perpendicular to the smallest opening. OK, so if you have uh, a vertical opening, right, I'm going to insert it this way. OK, it's, it's a two dimensional representation of a 3D uh, object. So that's how we're going to do that. You basically you insert that. Let's say if I had vertical slats, insert it perpendicular to the smallest opening. If I can touch the hazard with the gotcha stick, We've got to move that password back until I can. Easy peasy. It's good. Okay. That's it. It's your gotcha stick instructional tutorial. And if you forget, instructions are on it. Okay. And that applies to fixed and movable guards, by the way. Okay, so what does the NCB 11.19 say about fixed guards? It says the guards shall be designed and constructed to provide visibility of the hazard zone to uh, appropriate to the particular operation. So we want to make things visible. Where visibility of the operation is required, appropriate materials and color for the device should be selected. Um, for example, the perforated material or wire mesh should provide adequate open viewing area. The color should be darker than the area observed to enhance visibility. We see what happened there. All that changed was the meshing. We did a darker color. Look how much more visible that machine got. Okay, so that's a good tip is to use a darker color on the mesh than what's behind it. Uh, that's going to incent people to not remove the physical guard to be able to look just if they're visually diagnosing something, which is it's good, right? It's a fixed guard. We don't we want to design it to where it's not really needs to be moved unless it absolutely has to. So that's an interesting feature. Um, of the human eyeball. If we make it a little darker, you can see better, so make sure to do that. Um, again, there's an example of, uh, I would say, a poorly guarded machine because it's pretty much impossible to see, to see what's going on back there. Okay, again, where, where to apply fixed guards, right? Very low operator access, okay? And then if there's areas of maintenance that are behind, then you can put a little movable guard in front of that area of maintenance. They were going to interlock that movable guard, so to monitor, talk about that. But that's ways that we can address those maintenance areas so that you don't have to remove the whole fixed guard. Uh, really good because they can protect against the ejected material, uh, you know, noise, radiation, explosion. Make sure that when you specify a fixed guard, if you're guarding a robotic cell, uh, let's make sure we understand the forces of the robot. Okay, so it doesn't do much good to keep a beast of a robot, palletizing robot, contained with a wire mesh guard, right? If you over travel, it's just going to smash through it. So there's that to consider, too. Um, some disadvantages are obviously it limits access, uh, could limit visibility, and could make machine adjustment and repair a little bit more uh, problematic or time consuming. Okay, can be forgotten to be replaced when removed for maintenance. Course. That's part of the reason why we want to make sure that A, we don't design them in places that they need to access a lot. And B, if we do, we take measures to protect against that, like putting, you know, caps, uh, retained screws, things of that nature. That's also where that yearly audit comes in to double check for things like that. Okay. Then we bump up into so fixed guarding. Everybody good to go? There's no monitor, right? There's no electronic safety, there's no control circuit. It's a physical guard, we install it, we're good to go. Doesn't have to have any sort of engineering control uh, in terms of interlocks or logic or anything. Uh, let's see, frequency of exposure, access. Now we're gonna jump to moderate. Again, this is up to you guys, it's up to the stakeholders, right? To understand what's gonna apply best. Um, and everybody has a different take on whether we should put in a movable guard or we should put in a light guard, right? Um, effectively, movable guards, 
uh, are guards which can be opened without the use of tools, so they're designed to be opened. Because of that, the standard says we must interlock them. Okay, uh, they must be securely fastened. This is a piece I think it touches on the reset. The interlocked guard shall not be able to close by itself and allow activation of the interlocking circuit. So if it closes, it just, the machine just can't just start right back up. That's that reset feature. Sometimes a reset feature could be turning a bolt to lock something that could count as reset, but typically you want a blue reset. Um, so we want to reset every time we close a, a guard, reset and then hit start. Um, yeah, when, when the interlocked guard is closed, the interlocking shall not in and of itself cause reinitiating of the hazard. That's basically manual reset required. Got to hit a start button. And that reset should be in a place that's where it's visible into the hazard. Okay, so you want a visible uh, reset. Interlocked guard shall prevent be pre interlocked guard shall be prevented from opening until the hazard has ceased or shall be located so that an individual cannot reach the hazard before the cessation of the hazard when the interlocked guard is open. So this is all about what type of hazard you're guarding against. If it's something that uh, the machine safe circuit turns power off to whatever's controlling the hazard, but there's some overhauling load, we just want to make sure we account for that in the design, right? So that if you open a door. The hazard doesn't have power, but it may still be spinning. So in those cases, we'll, what we'll do is we'll interlock, we'll actually lock the door until we safely verify that that hazard is ceased. Then we'll unlock the device and we'll allow for open. Okay. The safe distance calculation equations that I gave to you guys that are on your PDFs have that uh, equation in there, so you can decide. You can always put a movable guard even on something that's overhauling load, right? You might just have to put it right here if the overhauling load's over there. And then you might say, that's way too, way too much floor space. It's not cheap in Minneapolis, Chris. Okay, we'll put a locking guard on it and I'll save you that much floor space and we'll safely verify that it stops before you let me open. Okay, so it's just decisions to make, different ways to slice it. Okay, you got that on the flash drive, so I'm not gonna, not gonna show you how to do mathematics but that's the safe distance equation right there okay movable guards some of the advantages uh constructed to suit many applications allows easy access to the machinery for clearing jams we talked about that yep periodic maintenance part change uh contains flying part can, oh still contains flying parts or fluids right we don't want to throw a light curtain like that on a chip grinder it's not going to contain anything um some disadvantages may require adjustment and maintenance because you have things like door sag some of the new technology door switches actually monitor for that um also can interfere with visibility and gates create a new hazard uh closer to the operator um things like that just consider the safety of uh the design that you're picking basically all right so i'm going to go through and show you guys some examples tech i mean Pretty straightforward, right? We have mechanical interlocks. This is a mechanical guard locking interlock. We've got non-contact non switches, and then we have locking non-contact switches. Okay, so mechanical interlock, non-contact, these are used to uh, immediately, for generally used for hazards on movable guards that immediately stop. This guy locks and this guy locks. So those are usually, we use those on hazards that have overhauling load where we're keeping the operator out and then verifying that the hazard stopped and letting them in. Also, we use these sometimes for uh, process safety. Like it doesn't have anything to do with human safety, but if that guy opens that semi tool chamber, it's gonna toast 120 grand worth of our process. Nobody can open it. And if you put one of these on there, somebody can open it, right? And so sometimes what we'll do is we'll see locking uh, guards on there just simply to protect the process and to protect people but with these you actually have to request to enter so you hit a request to enter button machine logic does its job it allows the machine to make a decision on if it's going to let you into the process or not. you have a little bit more control controls engineers love it question yeah on the process that's where you could use the power locked and if you're going for the opposite you need a power unlock yeah so there's power to lock and power to unlock uh 
power to lock basically is uh, you apply power, it's not going to let you in. No, you don't use that process. Yeah, I mean, if you lose power on a process, process is probably yeah. toasted anyways. Yeah, so I would say yes, that's all or momentum and that kind of thing. You're not supposed to use that technical option. So if it was, uh, if it would be the other type would be there's power to lock, which we just talked about. Yeah. Power to unlock. So if we lose power, it's locked. That would be better for a mechanical hazard. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Good, no, it's like cheating. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, that's absolutely it. Well, that, and that's the reason that with this guy. So this does it with this. By the way, is our little safety switch. This is a a a, sol a magnet, an electromagnet. Okay. We can't use this in the mechanical hazard situation because if we lose power, I lose my magnetic field, I can open it immediately and I might run into a hazard. So that's the exact same reason that we use uh, power to unlock or can't use power to unlock in that case. Or I need to make sure you have something else. Yeah, that's the other one too. Like it doesn't dissipate heat very fast. If you want to use oh. Yep. Power to unlock. Power to unlock. Yeah. Power to unlock. Yeah, the heat one is really interesting, right? Because I mean I've seen like I honestly I saw an oven guarded with a white curtain once when I'll try and play this one bad in people, but yeah. It was at a, it was at a steel plant and the guy was like Oh, you're all wrong, right? He's a maintenance guy. He's like, yeah, we got some banner light curtains. Are your light curtains better than those? And I was like, I don't know. Probably. Not that's <laughs> he's like, well, he's like, he's like, let me show you, let me show you these, you know, light, light curtains. So I go over to this uh, ingot oven where they put these big ingots in, and he's got the light curtains like right in front of where the door opens. And I'm not joking. The plastic lenses were bubbled and melted down <laughs> on the machine. He's like. It's like you put your some of yours in there, see how they do it. And I was like, yeah, it's gonna melt like that too. Like, like, <laughs> and I'd be like, what? What are we guarding against? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, we have to think about. I like to think about just, uh, you know, that when at what point is the hazard eliminated, right? And preventing access until we know safely that the hazard is gone, and then allowing access. So, yeah. Okay. Some examples of stuff like this, stuff like that on this point with the light curtains. This is stuff I see in the field all the time with interlocking devices, right? Proximity sensors, non-safety rated devices. Remember, we can't we can't meet the category anything except for B, which doesn't get used very much. With proximity sensors, they can get defeated by doing stuff like this, which happens. Uh, they also proximity sensors they fail on. Sometimes, sometimes they fail off. We don't know. Okay, so we don't want to assume that it's failed on. Looks like the guard's closed, but in fact, the guard's open. Somebody's getting hurt because uh, we didn't have a safety rated device. I don't prefer limit switches ever. There are safety rated limit switches. I just, it's older tech. We have non contact stuff now that's just as every bit as good and better. Uh, they are super inexpensive, I'll say that, but it's the price difference. I mean, for the hardware, it's, not going to change your project budget, right? Um, and I was going to say, oh, it's too easy to take a safety rated switch that fails and replace it with a non safety rated switch. And I've seen that happen in the field too, because the, the footprints are both the safety, the safety limit switch and normal limit switch are exactly the same. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. So, and then somebody did this. You know what I mean? Was this maintenance or production that did this? Who did this? Okay. Yeah, it was production for sure. You know why? Because um, if maintenance would have done it, they would have they would have tidied up that <laughs> right there. You know what I mean? Clean it up a little. Stuff like this, right? These are some um, just think about this type of stuff when you do your design and you consult with the people, the operators, right? When you pick out safety equipment, some of the new non-contact stuff that we have is really small. I love that because you don't even know it's there. And in my opinion, if the operator doesn't know it's there, great. It's protecting them and they don't even know it. And if they don't know it's there, they don't know how to remove it. So, cool stuff. Is that just like a safety proximate? 
So safety procs, which is do exist, and that's what you're going to want to specify. Sure. Um, and make sure that it's a safety rated proc switch. And so I think I'm going to talk about, yeah, good topic. Uh, so whenever you pick devices for your safety, right, so input, logic, or output, all of those you want to be safety rated. Um, and so you can pick a safety rated proc switch. And the way that you're, what you're going to want to do is make sure that it's safety rated. Uh, the way that you can do that is look at the manufacturer's website. Uh, generally, they will state, remember this is the B2 standard. They will state what B2 standard they're adhering to. Um, and, and or you will see this positive force guided symbol. Okay. Uh, if you're in doubt, you can ask the manufacturer to supply the certificate of compliance to ensure that it's safety rated. It's going to come from a company called TUV and look like this. So if you're having trouble finding that it's actually safety rated, you could ask ask a sales rep. Okay. Or if that person's annoying you, ask the application engineer. Yeah. Sales reps again. Uh, all right, taking all my sales reps. All right, so uh, that symbol, uh, this positively driven contact symbol, this is an illustration of what this means. It basically it means we're not relying on a spring to change the state of the circuit. It's a, it's a physical uh, linkage that's gonna break those contacts open or closed. Okay, and so as you can see demonstrated here, right? Here's the physical linkage. It's physically pushing apart those contacts and that's to protect against welding. The other thing that safety rated device, so safety rated devices, if they're electromechanical, they have that feature. They also generally will have better protection on the contacts to avoid for pitting and things of that nature, failure. Um, those are the types of things that, that uh, those standards are calling out for manufacturers. So if you look at a safety rated switch and you're like, ah, oh, it's more expensive, there's, there's technical reasons why it's more expensive. It's not like wedding photography and just say wedding on front and charge you 30% more. No wedding photographers in the room, are they? Um, I'm kidding. All right, so mechanical interlocking device, when to apply. Okay, um, any movable guard, basically. Uh, you can use them on swing, sliding, lift off guards. Less space is needed. Uh, they are low cost. Uh, the electromechanical switches are inexpensive, like 50, 60 bucks a switch. Uh, so inexpensive. Um, get a wide range of sizes. You can lock them out which is helpful um and then some disadvantages yeah as same with movable guards and, and interlocks you, you, there's some maintenance required you don't want to use these with a really bad dusty dirty grimy environment because they do have open um basically openings where dirt dust can can infiltrate that and start to corrode the switch um, so that's not the best but again it's a safety circuit so it's going to see if that happens it's good the, those non-contact switches, for me, I, I think those are the bees and the E's. And then the only thing that you have to take into consideration is with those, you have to provide some latching mechanism because, you know, those are just non-contact. So if you have a door, something's going to need to latch itself. Whereas these do provide some uh, retentive, like, holding force that you can use as kind of a, a switch and a latch. Any questions? You guys use these? Yeah. Okay, sometimes. Uh, let's see. Okay, guard locking interlock. Same as same thing as a mechanical interlock, guys. This one, because it's guard locking, here's our solenoid, which we talked about. What was your name again? Derek. Derek. What company do you work for? Anagram International. Anagram. Okay, cool. Yeah, say, this is what we talked about. Looks exactly the same. And then here's our either power to lock or power to unlock solenoid. So very similar. Okay, what we talked about, um, why you use the guard locking style, right? We can do some process protection. Uh, it allows uh, the hazard to be ceased before the operator can access it. So unlocks only when hazardous motion is ceased. Uh, power to lock, power to unlock, tamper resistant. Okay, some disadvantages. Yeah, may require additional maintenance for alignment. Things of that nature. Do any of you guys use safety rated limit switches? Be good. We're going to skip this section. 
You shouldn't. I they're not like they're yeah. I would go non-contact. They're like again, it's just you can use them, there's nothing wrong with them, but very easy to be replaced by a normal non-safety device, which is going to defeat the effort of designing it safely. Um, also, it requires two of them to meet category. Like they're just a pain. Uh, so I would say tend more to the side of the mechanical interlock with the non-contact or physical guards. These can be defeated really easy too. They are inexpensive. So there's that, but it's I mean it's what fifteen dollars less expensive than a mechanical interlock. So it's not like we're not talking you know, huge amounts of dollars. Safety limit switches when to apply. Never. Cool. Next topic. <laughs> uh, safety rated hinge switch. These are cool. There's some cool tech uh, also with um, with actual safety switches built into hinges. This is another example. Um, this kind of goes to the philosophy of design it so that somebody doesn't really know where the safety switch is. You can You can have a hinge switch like this. Uh, where it's just going to do rotational position and it'll do it switching based on that. Um, so that's that's a good thing. Just, uh, you know, you want to be careful on your access points based on how how big the door is, right? Because if your switching points are fixed and you've got this big radius and you're swinging a door, you might not open until that door is a foot and a half wide. So you, you want to account for that. Um, but that's another option. Minimal alignment problems, difficult to defeat, um, less space, low cost. Yep, all those things. Large doors may provide access to the hazardous area. We got like 10 more. Achieving control reliability with interlocks. Let's do this. Where are we at? Okay. All right, how to ensure your interlock safety circuit performance meets the safety circuit performance requirements set forth in the risk assessment. All right, so let's do talk quiz. So we talked about this. This is this is a very verbose slide, but it basically what it says is for, for your high risk levels, we want to use can we want a control reliable circuit architecture. Okay. So what does that mean? It's fail safe, redundant, um, it detects faults either immediately or very quickly after the faults happen. Okay. That's what that that's what that's all about. Okay. And then we talked about this difference between both category three and category four are redundant. So there's redundancies, some fails, something else is going to take over. The big difference between three and four was that with category four, single faults are detected at or before the next demand upon the safety functions, okay? And an accumulation of undetected faults cannot lead to the loss of the safety function. Whereas with category three, single fault detection does not mean that all faults will be detected immediately. Okay, remember that. All right, we got like five more minutes. We'll do a little, little pop quiz. All right, so what do we think on this safety circuit? I've got an input. Okay, I've got my logic and I've got my output. This is a safety rated device. I know that because I talked to the manufacturer, they provided me a TUV certificate. I also know that because it has that B standard on there, that EN standard and the arrow with the circle around it. So I know that's safe. I know this guy is safe. Check the data sheet, it had safety requirements, and this is the positively force guided output. So I got safety, 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 good to go. Uh, question to you. Uh, what is the circuit architecture here? Category two. Category two? Single channel with monitor. Single channel with monitor. Agree, disagree? Yep. Agree. Yep. Single channel with monitor. We got one channel here, one channel here. We got monitoring going on. This is monitoring this guy. This is uh, back to the machine control and part of what we do in the next step after we do an assessment is how do we tie in the machine control? You'll notice this is the safety circuit, right? Input, logic, output, and then our machine control is here. So we're not we're not in integrating into that. We're laying over top of that and then just interfacing with it. Okay. Some of the new design stuff, uh, tech technologies exist now that incorporate safety and standard controls into one. 
So the line is a little bit less defined physically, but electronically within those controllers, it's the font again, and the software is too, for sure. You guys have played around in Sysmac Studio or any of these uh, control softwares that have both. Uh, but I just wanted to point that out. It's a separate circuit, and you get a gold star on your name for today because you were correct. It is a single channel with monitoring. How about now? What do you think? Single channel with monitoring? Single channel redundant? Trickier one. This one's going to be single channel with monitoring because we're still just relying on this single channel to shut the hazard off. We are, we do have dual channel on the input, which is great. It's better than it was. Okay. What do we think now? He knows what it is. You're just not saying it. You're just like, I know it is dual channel. Yeah. You're not or dual channel. Yep. All right. Dual channel redundant. Okay. So we've got dual channel here, dual channel here, or monitor. We're all good. Okay. Uh, is this a category three or category four circuit the way it's set up here? So we know it's dual channel with monitor, which we know is either category three or four. Which one is it? Three or two? Yeah, I know. I see that too. I would say that too. It's actually four. And the reason why is that with mechanical switches, unless we... Uh, do what's called a fault exclusion in our documentation. There is actually a single point of failure in this system to the safety, and it has to do with this actuator head. Okay, so actuator heads can and are known to shear off completely. And especially, I know it seems silly, but it happens. So if we are using mechanical switches and you want a category four circuit, you have to have two of them to account for that shearing. If you mount the door properly with a stop that's not the actuator, okay? So you have a bump stop, right? Instead of relying on the actuator to stop the door, you can then account for that in what's called a fault exclusion. And you could technically be a category four. It's safety nerd stuff. It's a point I like to make because you can alleviate this with use of a non-contact switch and you only need one of them per door. So you can get with a non-contact elect electric solid state switch, sorry, you can get category four with one device on a moving guard. Just a little easier way to get there. We left off with our pop quiz, uh, non-contact door interlocks. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of get to it. A lot of this stuff is pretty straightforward uh, as far as technology goes, okay? Uh, there's the old style, which is read and hall effect back when I was, the first off into my career now, everything's gone to RFID, it seems. Um, big benefit there because they can be individually coded. So, you, you know, Joe, the maintenance guy, doesn't have a pocket full of them that he can walk around and tape to every door. He's got to have individual coded ones that match exactly, and there's only one in the world. So, bummer for Joe, but good for safety. Um, so, that's what everything's going to. They also have better misalignment tolerances. Okay. And I, I really am a fan of the RFID non contact switches got a nice line of them. They're small. Like I said, they can be tucked away, very uh, impervious to things like dirt dust, all that sort of stuff. All right, I'm gonna uh, run through a bunch of examples of safety circuits. And what you're gonna notice is that they all start to look the same because regardless of the technology, because it's safety, the outputs are similar, they're redundant, and the control system is, it ends up looking similar. So here's a, uh, an example of a non-contact door interlock set up for a category yeah category four you said that you said that. oh eric right <laughs> <laughs> right on well cool operations guys on board all right so um that's category four so we've got dual contacts we've got our safety relay monitoring input logic output uh and then our machine controls down here Right. And then again, I had mentioned some manufacturers, you may be able to get away with daisy chaining on contact interlocks. Just make sure you verify the product you're using is rated to do that. It's a lot with safety, guys. If you're going to use something in a safety application, verify that it's designed to do that. And if it's you designing it to do that, make sure you consult with the manufacturer. OK, 
because usually the, the products have been designed specifically for, for certain things. Oh, right. Uh, hey, when to apply. Difficult. Uh, so when to apply non-contact interlocks. Uh, I again for interlocking doors, I I feel like this is the go to. They're very difficult to defeat. Um, they don't have a lot of alignment problems with the new technology. Uh, they can there's devices now which will give you more data in terms of like misalignment even so you can monitor that. Uh, good for washdown can be applied to movable guards. I opt towards uh, the non contact for most movable guard applications. Of course, not always the best if it has to be a locking interlock. Um, but for any non locking interlock. Application uh, really good. OK, um, disadvantage we touched on this. They don't necessarily have holding force, so you just got to make sure there's flash on the door. Okay? Otherwise, the door should be open. Okay. This is a unique product. A lot of process safety applications. Uh, will use this guy. Uh, I've seen it to keep people out of spray booths and things of that nature. Uh, it's a non contact switch right here coupled to an electro uh, magnetic. That's right. We're yeah, electromagnet basically. OK, so this thing powers up. He's got this guy locks in place and it monitors that the gate is closed with that switch. Um, you know, they can have very high force, so nobody's getting that open. It's like I think that's like over a thousand pounds of holding force. Really heavy duty can be washed down, beat them up, all that good stuff. OK, uh, again. Category, what guys? Not Eric. Somebody help me. Or, all right, right on. Cool. Success. You guys are identifying circuit architectures. Beautiful. Like it. Um, so that's what it looks like. Very similar, right? Input, logic, output, interface to the PLC. We can do that in a number of ways. Digital, digitally. Uh, there's Ethernet communications that can do that, regardless of whatever your control system is. Like we got you. OK. Um, when to apply these minimal alignment problems recommended for washdown. Uh, yep, cannot be used on machine with long run downtimes uh, because of their power lock option only we get on that. OK, so that's our movable guards, medium interfacing. Now we're going to we access this thing all the time. We want to have people putting parts in, taking parts out. Uh, we interface with this thing three times every five minutes, right? That's a high frequency of exposure. This is where we want to go towards things that don't require annual intervention to move guards and barriers, right? We just want to protect somebody. And this is where something like a light curtain like that is really helpful or a safety laser scanner down here. Uh, both of these fall under the category of uh, what are called PSDs present sensing devices, okay? And they basically use uh, sensing fields, okay? In this case with light curtains, it's infrared light. In the case of safety scanners, it's a laser. It's, uh, do you guys know? You guys know what safety scanners are, yeah? Cool, yeah, laser source shoots up, it's a spinning mirror. Uh, it's got this, PF, they all have this PFM technology. You guys heard that one? That the manufacturers of pure freaking magic <laughs> there, so, where the laser goes up out hits the guy comes back measures the time distance equals time times something that they have also gives that anyways um super cool technology but these are really cool because they can be um configured so that you um you can reconfigure them very easily so they're very adjustable use a lot of these on use a lot of these on mobile applications as well because you can change that safety area dynamically really good for mobile robots because you can change based on the area that they're operating okay all right uh let's see so yeah light curtains we again things with high frequency access so something like a punch press right we have two hand control here that's valid. I, I don't love two hand control because somebody can hit the two hand control and a coworker can be picking a part out of the system. It just to me, it's like if you put a light curtain on something, it will stop the hazard when anybody reaches it. And that's, I mean, what we're trying to protect against. Uh, there's different types, right? There's 
a machine, what we call, what we refer to as machine guarding. Different manufacturers will call them different things. Um, but there's basically two types. There's the point of operation protection, which we call machine guarding. That's we're going to put it right in front of the hazard, right? Somebody reaches into the hazard, it's going to shut the hazard off. Then there's also the perimeter guarding type. These are generally perimeter guarding or generally uh, longer range. They're also bigger resolution, meaning the resolution, are you guys familiar with like the resolution is just all about how, how far apart are the beams, right? To detect something on these longer range ones, they're much lower resolution because we're guarding a very long, big area where we're keeping somebody out of a perimeter. So you think about it as like a fixed gate, but it allows you to walk through in and out of a production cell. Okay. Um, yep, machine guard. So type two and type four. Type two is not a thing anymore, guys. It's mostly type four. Um, and that's a largely in part of it because of the uh, the technology cost has come down so much to produce these things. I don't think the price point varies. So most manufacturers just issue type four and that's it. Okay, um, perimeter guard light curtains. We can do up to 110 meter range on a perimeter guard. Yeah, so like you don't have to worry, we got it. Um, the other thing is you'd be like, well, we're not guarding anything that big. That's a cool feature, but we're not guarding a football field. Um, the benefit of having that power is that it will also add, it has more gain. So if you have like a bad uh, dusty atmosphere or if you get garbage on the lens, it'll push through that with the infrared power. So there's there's some benefit there too, even if you don't have a huge application, like a huge uh, in terms of distance that you're doing. Um, and then the machine, the, um, very good question. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, is is the implication of the perimeter, the perimeter guard more complicated by the fact that someone can be like inside the perimeter while not? Yeah, like, yeah, dude, yes. Yeah, you do have to account for that, right? So it can't be auto reset, right? I can't walk through and it stops. And then after I go all the way in, the circuits reset. Uh, the other thing is we need to make sure that there's nobody in the cell before we reset the cell. And that applies to a robotic cell too, right? Like even if it had a gate, uh, we have to make sure that before we reset that, we verify that there's nobody in that cell. The standards say it is sufficient to have a reset uh, button and an operator to visually verify to do that. That's sufficient. Um, I would say that my recommendation is that this, that's what the standard says, but I would say that Oftentimes, based on visibility, sometimes companies will put other means to verify that people aren't in that area. Safety mats, sometimes uh, area scanners, right? Or maybe just an area scanner in an area that's not visible to the operator that's hitting the reset. But according to the standard, you can rely on an operator to reset that system. Uh, but yeah, that is a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, this says 30 meter range perimeter access. It actually, it was, that's a typo. It's 30 meter range on our point of operation guarding. Again, it's like big deal. I don't, we don't have a point of operation that we're trying to do 30 meters. Benefit is that it's got a lot of gain power so that you don't have to maintain clean, worry about false tripping. Uh, it, that, that gain power pushes through that and that's helpful. Um, okay, they're very rugged. Also, and I put a video on LinkedIn where I smashed a home run with one of these guys, and I mean smashed it. I got it good. Um, and the I plugged in light curtain and it just worked. So, anyways, if you want to see a funny video, there you so have it. Do you guys offer like alignment stuff? Because I mean, that's that. I mean, I've had light curtains before that. It, there's six degrees of freedom, right? You're kind of yeah. Line. So yeah. So the light curtains. Um, we do offer a laser laser alignment tool that can plug onto the top of it. But I will tell you that I've uh, I have it was actually the same steel plant where the dude showed me uh, some melting light curtains. Um, he wanted me to do a demo, and we were at uh, I think it was 55 feet, and I literally aligned them. I'm not joking, dude. I mounted these things onto plywood bases, okay, two of them, and went down there and stood them up. 50 feet away, stood it on a plywood base on a factory floor, stood this one on a plywood base, 
and I literally was able to do this and they have LED lights on them. So I could see right. when the LED lights would light up. And uh, so my message is that that increase amount of range also, it, it helps, it's, it doesn't, uh, it helps to uh, kind of like cushion against that. Uh, you have basically more uh, energy going through. So if you're slightly misaligned, there's still enough energy to okay. make that, right? And then what I did is I monitored, we have a software tool where you can monitor the beam strength. And I just monitored that. So it was it was made, but maybe it was only, you know, 5% above, above the switch point. Sure. And I was able to kind of play with it this way and see that game go way up. And I was like, okay, cool. It's fine. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we, we do have a laser alignment tool, but I would say that the, these LEDs on here play a big help in. Yeah, you guys know if you've worked with light curtains, uh, you see some wonky stuff go on. One of them, we had the top and the bottom of the light curtains completely aligned and the middle, like the guy had bracketed the middle and it, tor it torqued it a little bit and that caused a bunch of issues. So yeah, there's, we can help you out and give the guys here a call or us and, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's a great product. Uh, this, this new version that we came out with, it's on that machine right there actually. Uh, okay, and then there's safe distance mounting considerations to be had with light curtains. Um, in our, we have a free software tool, it's called SD Manager 3. Uh, I like it because it's super simple to use, but it also has a uh, application safe distance calculating tool in there. So you can go to, I think it says like S, it's on the top toolbar. You click that, and then you can actually pick what type of application you have, you input the data, the parameters of your application, and it spits out your safe distance. Okay, pretty cool. Um, and then sometimes, to, just to be aware, I see this in my curtain applications. It's like, oh my gosh, that's it wants us to mount this thing a meter and a half away. Like we don't have that much room, right? Um, the other option is then we need to start looking at how to control the hazard, how to bring the hazard to a vault in a controllable way quicker. And we have advanced motion control control systems to help with that. Okay, so that's another thing they can look at. Uh, but that can be surprising when you see that number. It's like, oh well, wow, you know. But really important. Uh, there's also a table in our user's manual uh, to account for thing, things like reach over distances. Uh, that that can be found in our user's manual, or it can be found in the B standard for. Uh, application of safety light curtains. So 11.19, uh, you can find that information. Okay, a light curtain will have an MCTFD uh, for it. It will also actually, because uh, it is uh, itself, it has a safety controller on board. So it's actually rated performance level E at outputs. Uh, it will tell you that that's a, so you can, you so, what that means is that you can actually run the outputs of a light curtain directly to your switching, your final switching devices, and you're good. It, it also has a monitoring circuit that can monitor. Okay. Um, it, the, depending on how many safety devices you have on your system is going to play into what your circuit architecture looks like, right? Um, if you only have a light curtain uh, that's protecting the machine and knee stop, you know, no reason to have a safety controller. Right? You've got two devices. Uh, you can do a safety monitoring relay, relay for the e-stop. The light curtain itself has got a controller. Uh, we don't see this a whole lot for bigger work cells because we've got multiple safety devices, and so you'll see a safety controller involved. And like you say, but that's how that wire would go. All right, so when to apply light curtains, just quick access. Uh, Obviously, they do not contain projectile hazards, can't guard against heat uh, as much as we try. <laughs> um, must be used on machines with a relatively quick rundown. Uh, must be used on machines which can be stopped anywhere in the process. That's one thing is you get like sales guys walking around your plant, like doing this and stuff like that. And we don't see that there's a perimeter guard light curtain because one stick is 50 yards that way, one sticks this way, and we're walking down the plant, we go like that, and we can shut the system down just like that. I've ever done that. But um, light, light curtains don't have any warning, right? So like if somebody doesn't know the perimeter guards there, and it's, it can happen, 
it's just on or off. Whereas a safety scanner, you can actually have a warning zone, right? Which can say, hey, you're getting close to shutting this process off. So just keeping that in mind, if you know, if that is, uh, depends on your application, right? But something to keep in mind. There it is, area scanner. You guys know how these work. Uh, basically the modern replacement for a safety map. Okay, also performance level rated on the outputs. Interesting to note though, no matter who it is, uh, whatever manufacturer, doesn't matter. None, no safety scanner on the market is performance level E rated. Okay, the best we can do with a safety scanner is performance level D. So if you do your risk assessment, you find that you need a performance level E safety circuit, these guys are out. Okay, I think it has to do with the property that it relies on diffusing the laser back as opposed to a light curtain, which is like very reliable through beam. Um, that's what I feel like is the reasoning behind that. But, uh, but anyways, that's an important feature to know. Uh, but again, in most robotic applications down here, we use them on AGVs. Performance level D is uh, very, very realistic. They can be set up for doing things like zoning, right? So you can mount them vertically. Got the robot working over here, doing some dangerous stuff. And then we've got an uh, operator doing load unload, right? Robot turns around, triggers a safe signal, right? Maybe it's a safety limit switch or it's it's, it's motion controller, safe rated motion controller says, yep, it's in this zone now. Switch this zone set over here. Um, and we can, we can do that. Now the operator can come service in and out of here. This is that um, question that you raised about uh, reset. Who was that? Right here. Yep. Um, or the robotic cell guarding. This is an example of using a safety scanner, right, to verify before reset. Um, our safety light curtains also have what's called a pre reset feature. Okay. And so this is important to know. It is designed to kind of alleviate against that, uh, leaving people, leaving operators in there. But basically, we put what's called a pre reset button on the inside of this work cell. Before the operator leaves, they hit pre reset. The light curtain is now monitoring to, to make sure that somebody leaves. Once that happens, it goes into basically a reset okay state. Then you hit the reset from the outside, then it goes over. So it's a little feature we put in our light curtains. You don't have to use it, but it's a thing you can use to avoid having to use a separate laser scanner. Okay. Safe distance, I won't go through that. And then this all kind of looks the same. I want to get to, okay, we all know where to apply safety scanners. Okay, I'm going to blast through two hand controls here because of time. I do want to show you this though. Uh, this is some real world engineering in the wild. Production efficiency, baby, all right? The operations guy comes by, the safety guy comes by, we pop that guy right on off of there and we're safe again. Yeah, it's the stuff, kind of stuff we see all the time. Uh, this is this is obviously a switch that was not a uh, safety rated two hand control. Couldn't have done that with that. See that kind of stuff all the time. See. Okay. Uh, what I want to get to is I want to get to before we get out of here. Okay, I'm not going to go through stop categories because we're running a little low on time. Um, e stop requirements. Okay, some simple stuff that we can that we can that we can address right off the bat to get things into better compliance. Um, we've got to make sure that we're using a yellow background on e stops, and we can't have anything guarded. Okay, so like this example here, that is a non-compliant e stop. Okay, um, the semiconductor you can buy these on the open market. Uh, they were designed and manufactured for the semiconductor industry where a process is extremely valuable. So if somebody like accidentally walks by and bumps the e-stop and it shuts off, right? Millions of dollars of product, bad news. So the semi S2 safety standard will allow for that. Industrial machine standard does not. So just be mindful because these are widely available and it's easy to think, well, it's an e-stop, just toss it on there. So be aware of that there are specific standards which guide what kind of guarding we can put on okay 120 millimeters uh basically on on center is what where we can have a guard and the guard can't go above. okay 
Okay, so basically we don't want to impede a hand because uh, it's an emergency. Water point trying to make that if the guard has the belts in it, a lot of the guards have notches on the side, so you still get your hand in it. Yes. Then does that make a difference? Uh, no, as long as it adheres to um, this requirement here, this 120 millimeter on center. Okay, so I would say no, as long as we're still adhering to that. There's like some, kind of some examples. And the radiant horn. Oh yeah, no, not compliant. Yeah, commercially available and not compliant. These would have to be further away. So not a, not a extremely expensive fix, right? But something that can be done to improve uh, compliance. Then we want to make sure we have a yellow background with a red button. And we want to make sure that it, the red button in most cases, mushroom style is preferred. Okay. Can we just go spray paint back here? Yellow? Sure. Yep. No problem. Quick fix. Okay. They need to be uh, non latching. Or I'm sorry, lashing. These stops need to be latched. So when you hit them, they latch close, and there has to be an intentional reset. So it's either a twist or it's a pull. Right. And then after that, there needs to be a reset that happens. OK, so and they need to be safety rated and be careful because if you buy your e-stops and you buy the button and then some manufacturers will sell contacts separately, make sure those contacts have the safety rated on them because it's it's easy to perk to slap on the normal push button contacts onto an e-stop. A lot of times it fit and they're not safety rated contacts. So just a heads up on that one. Usually, usually the contacts, like the little contact box, would be red. That's a good way to know. I know you showed up time there real quick. Did anybody ever see someone use an e-stop? Do you have it working today where that's the way they stop the machine, even when it's not an emergency? Does that happen? That's a fun. It's a great way to design that out, like Chris is talking yeah. about. Yeah. We don't want to yep. save yourself and have a, you know, have a safe stop, like you mentioned, semiconductor. We all have process control. If we stop, inadvertently use a safety stop to stop our manufacturing, you're probably going to scratch something. Be intentional, right? And there's a lot of ways to do it the right way. Yeah. So e stops, uh, absolutely. They're not safety devices. They're not safeguarding devices. So it's not like hit the e stop to safeguard against this. It's like everything has gone to hell in a handbasket and we need to stop it. That's what an e stop is. Um, also, when you look at a, a control circuit, I don't want to see you guys putting interlocks in series with e stops. These stops should be on their own circuit. Okay. And it's, it's not my end. It's not to please me, it's to please the gods of the safety standards, by the way. They just say they want e stops on their own circuit. You can daisy chain them. That's not a problem. But don't intermix your e stop circuit with your interlock circuit, like your door interlock circuit. Okay. And I think that that's most to do with the frequency of use. Okay. E stops got to be on its own separate circuit. Okay. Here's a. Uh, Category. Oh, Eric. Something. <laughs> it's actually category three. Anybody got questions? Why? Okay. We know. We know. You guys are good. We know it's dual channel. We know it's redundant. Again, check this out real quick. This guy fails, okay? Channel A, channel B. This guy fails and doesn't open. It's welded shut. And I go hit this E stop. Everybody's happy, right? Nothing bad happens, nothing falls out. Now this channel falls, okay? So there was an accumulation of faults that just happened on this channel. Now I go to hit this E stop and I've lost my safety function. So, so in general, if you want categories of work, don't daisy chain things unless it says. All right. Um, this is to say that all most every industrial piece of equipment, you have to have an E stop. Okay. 
on most all industrial pieces of equipment, there has to be an e-stop and there has to be energy isolation devices, both air and electric. Got to be a way to lock those two out. Okay. Unless you don't have air, or else have to be, of course. Um, all right, so let's talk about safety logic controllers. You guys are familiar with safety relays, right? This is the logic part of the safety circuit. There are kind of like there's the safety relay, which I would say is you have two to three safety devices. Safety relay is a good option. If you have more than that, probably want to step up to something that's more of a safety controller, which can take multiple safety inputs and deal with multiple safety outputs. Okay. Those exist. And they're handling examples of handling uh, safety equipment. Okay. And we're used to tying into all different kinds of controls platforms. That's what we do in our engineering review. We're reviewing how do we how do we uh, integrate this into what is it out in the field? Okay. And typically it's either digitally or it's a via uh you know ethernet ethernet ip is a common one okay so then we're going to talk about I'll just show you with respect to this is safety control technology um the controllers that we use have machine control and safety control built into the same box effectively so this little silver piece right here is the machine controller this red module is the safety controller. It's all in the same box and it's all in the same program. Within SysMac Studio, the program can break out a separate section for your safety controls. So it's still the layer above, right? But it's kind of handy having it all in one software rep. So that all the tags are all the tags are there, data seamlessly integrates. You don't have to go spreadsheeting around, right? It's all it's all there for you. Um, wanted to touch on some of the newer tech is uh, obviously we, we run EtherCAT is uh, one of our preferred networks for safety. Okay, and we are able to do both safety and non safety data over EtherCAT. We're able to talk to remote safety nodes, take in traditional safety rated devices, or if there are, we talked about um, the Locking, locking and unlocking, or the locking interlocks, right? Power to unlock, power to lock. Back in the day, it was like, we need a locking solenoid on there, then we need two proc switches, right? We're gonna monitor the two proc switches to make sure that when the thing stops, then we got this safety rated frequency monitor that's monitoring that, and that's gonna talk to the uh, safety controller to tell it when the, okay? Like, now it's just this servo drive can do that. It's got safety built in, it talks ethernet right to the controller, there's no separate sensors. It can do safe positioning, safe motion. It can tell the safety controller when it's stopped. You don't have to have all these prop switches. And so it's cool how technology changes. Makes things a lot easier. And then you get a lot more data out of it because you have access to all these parameters in this device. So with the new standards, they just came out with ANSI, the B1119 2023. They're starting to address a lot of the things as far as like, the network security type stuff of safety, knowing that this is now the next uh, next round. Okay. All right. So just some just basic architectures. Well, not basic architectures, but architectures that can happen while utilizing safety networking. Okay. So this is uh, you know when we saw our diagram, I showed you interlock controller output. Right. This is the same stuff, but instead of four wires per device. If these are network enabled safety devices, we just plug the ethernet cable in and off we go. And then we get all the data out of these devices. Uh, in this controller, we have the ability to talk SIP safety, which we can talk to safe IO nodes that we offer, or we can talk directly to third party uh, robotic systems via SIP safe. Okay, a lot of the big robot manufacturers are using that as their safety network. Okay. And some of the obviously the big automation platforms as well. Okay. And we make a we make a good living was uh, coexisting with them. Um, so an example of application where we've got you know safety over EtherCAT, 
SIP safety. This guy's also got a separate Ethernet port, which we can uh, push data up. So if we need to gather information from the factory floor, we can. This is actually a separate Ethernet network than this SIP safety network. We can push that information out. So pretty cool stuff for the engineers in the room. Why showing here? Yeah, I think it's just going. It's showing we have uh, integration capability with Rockwell. And like I mentioned, we interface that with their networks, can communicate, not a problem. Yeah, I think that's what that's showing. Oh, this is a good one. So uh, a lot of plants in the US have this large install base of Rockwell, like no secret. Uh, big, big player in the industry. Uh, when we look at upgrading these systems, Okay, we can look at a way to do this very cost effectively and leveraging the existing Ethernet IP infrastructure of, of a Rockwell plant. We can add this SIP safety controller, which effectively can just add on the safety equipment and we can tag onto the already existing Ethernet IP Rockwell infrastructure in the plant. And that's super cool. And the reason why it's super cool is because the other option is that this whole machine control would have to be upgraded to a, to a Rockwell safety and logic controller, which would be extremely expensive. OK, so we can just tag on the safety piece. So that's a big, uh, big market player for us for doing those installs where we've already got existing infrastructure. We can add safety and again, like it or hate it or love it, safety sometimes is an afterthought, right? And so we get those plant owners that are like, well, it's this is grandfathered in. Like, no, it's not grandfathered in. We have to, we still have to safeguard it. So, uh, but we can utilize, right, all the infrastructure that's already there. So that's pretty cool. Uh, 